Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week, can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is proudly sponsored by Topping Technologies and ExpressVPN. Topping Talks is also on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere your podcast is. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. Guy says quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, you see. That's a joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about your privacy? If you are, then perfect. ExpressVPN consists. Even though 96% of stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does give 100% guarantee via the 30-day back money guarantee. Now, without further ado, I'm proud to say today I'm interviewing Bora Angel, who is the Director of Enterprise Data Architect at Fossil. Nice to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on the show, bud. It's been a lifetime. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a while. Right? So I was going to say, winding back the clock a couple of years, how do you first get into IT? It's quite a bit more than a couple of years now, but uh, I think I first got into IT because my mom was running an insurance company and she needed computer help. And I think I was like maybe fifth grade or sixth grade or something like that. And I was working with the IBM guys and kind of translating stuff to her. Mm-hmm. So uh, didn't get paid back then, but... Although the friends and family discount working for the family, it's free <laughs> <laughs> usually. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Is yeah. that the first computer you got your hands on too? Uh, first computer I got my hands on was a Spectrum Sinclair 16K, a whole 16K is around. Oh my gosh. Glorious, <laughs> you know. Yeah, the little keyboard with the, uh, so the plastic chiclet? keys. Yeah, the, the chiclet style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the, it had the, like the rubber keys actually. Oh yeah. And then uh, you have to plug it into a tape deck to be able to record your programs. So As in a cassette tape. Cassette tape, yeah. Back, back when music used to come on those things, way mm-hmm. back in the day. Yep, yep. People don't realize they actually had video games on cassettes. That's right. That's what we were doing. <laughs> we were, yeah, you know, all the video games we had, you, you know, you literally like put the cassette in there and then you hit play and then you hit, you basically type load and hit enter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it was, no, you type, yeah, you did load first and then you hit play. And then it would like read in the program. It was, I don't know, if you enter the lines of, Basic, probably. So, and what was the first thing you were doing on the computers back then? Um, I mean, learn basic uh, programming, obviously, on it, and then the first few things you do is like get it to draw stuff, and then uh, they. It, it was funny back then; they had these uh, magazines that literally, like basic magazines, and they just had lines of code of for programs, and you really? just typed it in, and you can just then modify it, and it will do stuff. So. You know, it was interesting because it was like a hundred lines of code was a big deal because you were all typing it in, you know, versus uh, I think one of the major projects I was working on a few years ago, like I noticed that we had over a hundred thousand lines of SQL code and, oh wow, you know, it, it was kind of funny. Uh, the scales are quite a bit bigger nowadays. Oh, def- data just keeps building and building and building. <laughs> and data is my job. Exactly. And then what was your first job in IT? I uh, was a uh, junior in college. I was working for Auburn University uh, IT help desk. Oh, really? That was, that was my first official IT job. Yeah. Nice. What was it like, or what was the craziest thing you ever saw? It was, it was, it was very interesting because we supported everything that the university ran, which was interesting because you had like DOS, Windows, Mac, and Macs, and Unix, and um, one of the interesting things, like I remember one of the secretaries calling up, and she was having some difficulties and you know anytime somebody asked because it was a big university and we would go like do you have a mac or windows in your uh, you know uh, environment you know environment and half half the the people who worked there could barely tell you like you're like okay do you have like a do you have like a little start button you know start thing on the screen or is it you know are you in a c prompt or Mm -hmm. so and we're talking to the secretary we're getting all frustrated because like everything we asked she was like no and it's like what does this? What does the monitor say? And she goes, "Oh, it says Sun Spark." So it was like she had a, you know, like at the time it was I think a fifteen thousand dollars Sun Spark workstation on her. Fifteen K. Yeah, back then they were a pretty big deal. I mean, they were the you know oh big gosh. Unix machine, uh, well, like Unix workstations that yeah. uh, apparently she was in engineering, and somebody in engineering school decided the secretary needed a uh, 
Is you know, multi-processing uh, work, Sun Workstation. So. Oh my gosh, what year was that? Cause is that fifteen k? That's fifteen thousand dollars back then. I believe so. This was about nineteen ninety-five, probably. That's like a million dollars now with inflation. <laughs> well, it, it was it was interesting because uh, you know Sun 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 Microsystems, the, yeah. the company who started up Java and all that. Oh yeah. Um, it was they used to design their own you know microprocessors and everything and. You know, fast forward maybe 10 plus years later, I was buying um, Sun servers for oh, yeah. a, a startup that I was working for. Um, these were like the early, some of the early days of commercial multi-processing we were doing. And it was really hilarious because they're like top of the line, one new servers that we were putting in. Um, they had AMD processors in them. Really? It was AMD has, you know, Eclipse you know, price performance wise, oh, yeah. even Spark, which Spark processors used to be the stuff. Yeah. You know, when we were in school, everyone, you know, was dreaming of that. So it was, it was interesting. It was, uh, uh, I, I think, I, I think I was very fortunate in like being in the curve of technology over my lifetime um, and just watching it grow and be there and actually working on things. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if I like really worked on anything like, Silicon Valley style, but, uh, you know, I had quite a few projects that were very interesting and just watching in, in IT, I'm not sure if there's anything new, like, because, you know, right now, well, everything is AI. Everybody's yeah. talking about AI, right? Big it's like before it was the cloud, right? It's Syner like, Synergy too. That's fancy. Cool. Yeah. CEOs love that term. Yeah. <laughs> before it was cloud and yeah. we're kind of laughing at it as like cloud, you know, somebody else's computer. I love that sticker. <laughs> I need to find who prints it. Cause it is such the, tr is, it is so true. And people don't realize like, oh, it's in the cloud. It's like, yeah, it just means the computer's not in your data center. Right. There's pros and cons to that. By which, the way, which was the same thing yeah. in the early days, yeah. right? Which is, you know, you had like a dummy terminal in your home and you used your modem to dial up to somebody else's computer. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, it's just like that. Exactly. <laughs> it always makes me smile when I, every once in a while, we'll do like an IT recycle project. You'll see like an old Sun Micro server or an old Sun Micro like a uh, monitor. Like, mm. oh man, they used to be huge. And I think technically, are they still around just today just for um, Oracle to slap their uh, software on? I forget I if they actually kept know. the hardware alive. Like you see it every once in a while on a colo. But like, huh. interesting. I remember yeah, that, I that was their, think about it. That was the fate it. of the company yeah. way back in the day. It was Oracle bought them out so they can put all their massive computing onto that. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I think I was. Uh, I'm not sure if I ever took my Sun, my, uh, Sun Unix admin uh, test, but yeah, I used to manage a lot of. Uh, I remember we had these giant Sun servers that oh, yeah. would run like. 50 to 200 databases at one time. Oh my gosh. And they would, what was amazing is that we loved them because they would stay up. Like you didn't have to reboot them all, oh, yeah. all year long. Like they would be up for a year. Oh yeah. Versus we had our like Windows NT servers and they have to be rebooted every week. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they would all like, maybe they could run one or two Oracle databases on them mm -hmm. when this, you know, Sun ones were running 50 to two, you know, 200. Oh yeah. So it was, they're bolted to a whole nother level. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was interesting days. I mean, it was uh, because even as a technology arch, especially as a data architect, the things that we had to do, the things that we knew back then, um, became very different, very simplified with cloud. Because mm -hmm. I remember I was working um, I was working at Accenture, mm -hmm. and I had a client which was one of the large um, telecom companies. And, one of the largest telecom companies in the U.S. I'm um, gonna guess one, 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 big, one no, of the no, big no, three. I'm not gonna, no, there were at oh, the okay. time there were five. There, I think oh, they were number four. Yeah, but um, we were doing. So, uh, I was asked to do a. Uh, I was asked to do a petabyte project at the time. This is before cloud, so that's a lot of data. Yeah. Oh my gosh. They gave me a 1.5 million dollar hardware budget, mm -hmm. and I had to figure out how to. This was early days of IoT. Uh, I had to figure out how to compress everything and get everything to be processed in, into a single EMC storage array that cost us 1.2 million oh at gosh. the time. And then the rest of it was the, the 300K was for a cluster of uh, Informatica slash like Oracle mm -hmm. clusters uh, servers from, I think, or from Dell at the time. So, yeah. um, but it was fun, kind of funny because they were looking at me to like, so what I do as a data architect, right, it, it, back then, so I had to design the overall, like the flow, what got processed where, you know, what kind of servers we had where, we, I would design all, all this stuff. 
but the major thing I had to figure out was like IOPS, right? Like how many input out output operations that can the system can handle, making sure that we were going to exceed that, like uh, meaning that like I had to figure out, okay, so this database, this setup, and we have this much data coming in, am I going to be able to handle it? Or do I need to go to a cluster that actually can process more? And, you know, so it would, I have to learn that uh, today, uh, most projects, most people don't have a clue anything about those because all they do is they go to their cloud console and they add another VM. Yep. <laughs> or, or if they're on like uh, Azure Synapse or BigQuery, they don't even do that. It's yeah. just basically, you, you know, you don't have to install the OS. You don't have to install the database management so software. You don't have to install any of that anymore. It's just, oh, yeah, I'm just going to allocate a new instance of BigQuery and yeah. just start loading stuff. So from those perspectives, things got quite a bit simpler, obviously. Absolutely. And then where did you end up going from Accenture? Um, so I was in Accenture maybe what, 10, 12 years ago. And I was, uh, when I left, I was, the, I was responsible for data architecture for uh, United States. Oh, wow. Uh, so I, was, I helped put together the classes that was teaching in advanced data uh, modeling. And I was teaching data modeling and... I was kind of overseeing a lot of data related projects and you know it was it was fun i learned a lot it was a very is i mean there is a reason accenture is doing oh. as well as they're doing of because, course <laughs> you know they're behemoth i didn't know half the things that accenture did when i worked there um but i was in a meeting one day and i realized like oh we we're putting satellites into orbit in addition yeah. to doing all this you know it projects so yeah. it, it's a very big, big company it's you got a lot of offerings. What was your favorite project that you could talk about or I guess it's subject matter or what was it like? I mean, was there a super complex project or like a interesting one that you know, sticks out above the others? Uh, the Petabyte project at yeah. the time was probably one of the, those. Um, <clears throat> the, we did do, yeah, there were, there were a lot of, there were a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of good projects. Um, one of the first customer data masters that I built, uh, I designed and built from scratch. Uh, that was uh, at Accenture. So that was, that was one of my specialties is doing uh, master data management and uh, data governance, obviously. So that was my first time I actually learned about master data management, designed a customer data master from scratch and had my team built it. And then, you know, over the next two years working with the client, oh, wow. you know, got improved on it and mm -hmm. was kind of on the heart of this um, enterprise customer data uh, warehouse uh, that they were running and you know it just keep, kept getting bigger because uh, being a telecom company back then that was th were the days of cord cutting right oh, yeah. so and it's just like uh, just like my current company now like the more your industry is getting more competitive the more difficult it is to make money yep the more that you have to invest in data because you yeah. gotta work smarter it's key you know and you can't work smarter unless you or investing in data. I was going to say you could have all the data in the world, but if you can't actually manage it and utilize it, it's worthless. Like you have to actually analyze it and you know learn how to upsell and expand the business and actually use make that data profitable, make it work for you. That's the real, yeah. real multi million dollar question or billion dollar question when it comes to the subject too. Which brings me to like how we met, right? Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, uh, responsible for um, data architecture for in the United States for. Um, Crayon, yeah, I've got Crayon, te you know, technology consulting, right? Uh, this is no affiliation to the Crayola company, All right? Owned by Hallmark. <laughs> That's right. Um, and th they're a company out of Oslo, Norway. And um, uh, like I said, I was leading their data governance, oh, sorry, data practice. And so it was fun going back to consulting. Yeah. And uh, and I would walk into a lot of different clients, and they would all go. Oh, our problems must be really unique. It's like, nope, every, <laughs> I've seen the same. Like, it was kind of funny because we would do assessments and then we would kind of help them with uh, putting together their data strategy. Mm -hmm. That's one of my strengths. And um, it was very interesting talking to these companies because they were like, oh, we're so unique. We have all these problems. Like, <laughs> nope, especially because I would walk in there with a sheet, uh, you know, sheet of questions mm -hmm. and I would ask them a bunch of these questions. And then like the next conversation, I would go, let me guess, you have a problem with X, you have a problem with Y, you have a problem with this, you have a, 
Like, how did you know? <laughs> yeah. like, yep. You're like every other company. Like, yep. <laughs> you have no idea what you sell. You don't know who your customers are. You, yeah. you know, and you can't, your CEO can't get a straight answer to, you know, one comes with an interesting question. Yep. So, yeah, um, it was literally uh, from very small to very large. I mean, very large. I'm talking about I had, I helped you know, Fortune 10 company or for, well, Fortune 20 company oh, wow. help with that exact same problem. I, like, I can't imagine how many, how much data those companies have, especially because a lot of them have been around for decades too. Yeah, and, well, some of it varies, where it's very interesting because they had a new CIO come in and he goes, and they're a technology company. Mm -hmm. He goes, I need to know how many software products we sell. Mm -hmm. So somebody in finance goes to their SAP system and comes back and goes, 335,000. What? <laughs> and he's like, no, we don't sell 335,000 individual software packages. Try again. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I end up coming in and building a... Um, uh, Even Microsoft doesn't have that many SKUs. Well, maybe, maybe by the end of the show, but... <laughs> well, the problem was they couldn't differentiate the difference between actual product and... Lifetime product? Well, umpteen variations of how they sold that product. Oh, geez. So they broke it down. Like if they have one product, then they also have different SKUs based on, I'm guessing, like duration of contract, like 12, 24, 36 months and all. If it's hosted oh, geez. or uh, SaaS oh, yeah. or client, uh, you know, installed uh, six months, 12 months, a year, three year, five, whatever. Every single variation oh, had wow. a different SKU. Jeez. Hence why they had thought they had 335,000. <laughs> but if you ask them like, well, how many, how many, and of course, uh, you know, this is pretty large enterprise software mm -hmm. and they had like Oracle, you know, Oracle database for this and Oracle database for, right. you know, or some, they had all these, uh, partner, uh, partner relationships, software products that were actually embedded. Like, oh, okay. you know, like you install their software, it actually installed a little uh, Oracle database or mm -hmm. Microsoft or whatever, you know. Um, so those got their own skews. So they of were course. looking at it going, oh, yeah, we're selling 335,000. It was like, no, <laughs> you know, which was funny because they're at the time they were, you know, over a hundred billion dollar company in revenues. Yeah. And it was kind of if you don't know what products you sell, how do you know which ones are profitable? Exactly. And they how, didn't know which ones were profitable. Then you have to hunt down all the data. What's the cost of goods really sold when you take into account all those hundreds of variables, not just the standard, oh yeah, it costs this much to put in the cloud. Well, what was the research and development? What was, how much does a sales rep get paid? What's the overhead for the customer or for the employee compensation packages? Like people don't realize how many variables go into seeing just if a product breaks even or makes a profit. Which is where actually data governance comes in. Yep. So a lot of data architects will end up in some point of their career working in data governance because mm -hmm. as a data architect, you can build all these awesome systems, but if the data going in is crap yeah. and there is no standard to the data, yeah. then your output is crap. Yeah. Well, I can say crap right yeah, now. Of course, say anyway. what you want. <laughs> so, um, so data governance comes in because uh, if you don't have a standard in the company, as far as what's a product, mm -hmm. what's a customer, yeah. you know, what's a sale, what's a transaction, a lot you'll be surprised how many companies can't even answer that what um oh my gosh yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's what data governance is like yeah. you literally we sit down so currently at fossil group mm -hmm. i'm also i once again i'm responsible for data governance mm -hmm. uh in addition to my other job but um so that's kind of what we do we go what's the customer and what's the consumer what's uh yeah. you know all these major business terms we get, get the standard uh, standards uh, from the fact that, for example, when we are capturing consumer data, like what are the bits of uh, consumer data you have to capture? Like what's the language code? Okay, well, for language code, it was kind of funny. Every system that was capturing language code for a customer, meaning like what language code they want to be, because we're a global company, right? Yep, so absolutely. they want to be communicated in, right? So we like to capture the language preference. That's great. Yep. Um, well, every system was using... You know, they would put ENG or EN or English or like, okay, no, you can't do that. Like, so we would have to go in, hey, we're using ISO 2 or language code. That's it. Every yeah. system. That's what we're like implementing standards uh, and then having, you know, making sure that um, you have to have some kind of uh, data quality solution or uh, analytics in place so that, uh, yeah, I did 
implement the standards, but standards that are not enforced are don't exist. So True. what you have to do is literally put in the reporting and the data quality solutions that are literally looking to make sure, hey, language code is always ISO2, mm -hmm. two digits, uppercase, yep. you know, whatever. So, and that here's the acceptable set. Yeah. Like you can't just make up your own two digits because people like to do that kind of stuff sometimes, and, you know. Um, but that's data governance, and that's how a lot of data architects end up being in data governance business because they get tired of building these really cool systems that don't potentially give the value that they should mm -hmm. for the investment. So you turn to like, okay, I got to handle the data governance side first. I got to have good data going into the platform mm -hmm. so that the, the platform that we built is actually, you know, used to most advantage by the businesses. So uh, that's what my job is essentially. Um, and when we talk about good data, uh, that's the thing about AI. If you feed, you know, crap data into an AI model, it's worthless, <laughs> right? It's gonna, um, so that's, again, if you want to be able to, a lot of, I mean, some of these are basics, like to me, data governance is the basics. Mm. Cause if you don't have, and I'll, it was surprising how many companies don't have a governance programs. Oh yeah. Um, now a little bit different nowadays, because I'll, if you deal with different types of data, mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of compliance like GDPR was a big one, right? Oh yeah. Um, now you have different, uh, within the U S you have different states coming up with their own version of it and et cetera. Oh yeah. So, uh, nowadays being a big, big business and not having a data governance program is going to be a little bit tough because yeah, you know, if might you, not be allowed to operate. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and the fines are big, Yeah. you know, uh, and when, when you're in front of, you know, the regulators and they are like, how come you allow this to happen? Uh, you know, what was your, who was leading your data governance program or compliance program? And they, they go, oh, we don't have one. It's like, well, that's not an acceptable answer. Yeah. Sorry, here's your, you know, penalty. That's not our issue. That's your so, issue. Here's right. a nice big fine. 7% of your uh, revenues for Re GDPR fines. Revenue or profits? Revenues. Ooh, that's cruel and unusual. 7%. So if the customer's only making 6% profit, all of a sudden they're at a big, nice loss. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Extra important to get that stuff right. <laughs> That's why. Um, so one of my jobs was when GDPR was going live back in the day, um, I led the program to make sure that we were GDPR compliant. Oh, wow. Uh, that was uh, that was kind of a big deal for us because the enforcement hasn't started. We just knew there was a 7% revenue penalty. So we had to show them that we were we had all our, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed and we had to be in a defensible position. Mm -hmm. And if consumers came into us and said, Hey, I want to see what you, data you have on me. We had the means to be able to fulfill that request within X number of days as within the law. Uh, and then, you know, if they tell us, Hey, you got to forget my data, you get forget me. We need to be able to make sure that, you know, whatever applicable systems and applicable pieces of data was removed or sanitized or whatever. Or else we, you know, it's gotta be difficult. We, we, we could have been fine. And you gotta talk to the backup team. Be like, hey, uh, by the way, that tape backup from a year ago. We gotta go in there. We gotta delete Bobby off the database. It's like that's, that is that's, part of what I do. It seems uh, a lot more complex. It's a lot more complex than people think and realize. I think as well. Yeah, and it's it's kind of funny because uh, I've seen some companies who go, oh, we'll just go delete this data off of you know, consumer told us to to delete their data mm -hmm. right? and they'll just go try to, you know, wipe it off databases and I'll go, <laughs> hold on a minute. Like, did you just delete a transaction? Like, you know, you understand that you have a legal requirement yeah. to keep track of your transactional data unmolested yeah. for depending on the country you're in U S I think it's about seven years, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. five years or seven years, whatever that is. Uh, it's like, you can't just delete your transactional data. You can't just delete the fact that you sold, you know, this person, that product. Well, the supply chain team is going to be pissed too. Cause again, it's all about the sales. You got to know how many widgets you need to buy. And also you got to keep track of the sales tax. Cause if you're the one doing the transaction, the legal burden is on you, not the customer to actually pay the local appropriate sales tax is right. So you got to keep track of all that too. <laughs> yeah. And you get, and when you get audited or oh, well, you, haven't read yet. Right? Yeah, <laughs> we have to be able to go back. So yep. Um, that's why it's like, you got to know what's applicable, what's not applicable. And that's all part of the, the whole data governance, you know, and compliance, uh, job that we actually do. So that is what I do today. Uh, and one side, I, I, uh, I have a team of data engineers that we 
take care of our consumer data platform so that our marketing folks, et cetera, um, have this cool platform that they can, uh, all the marketing teams around the world for Fossil Group can use it uh, to, you know, to show what kind of cool products in Fossil we have. Uh, yeah, to our consumers, a lot. yeah, under I think something like twenty brands or eighteen brands or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the cool part, but also lead the data governance so that you know we're we're, we're still in our journey. Uh, I mean, we're not we have, don't have the governance from soup to nuts yet. Mm-hmm. It's our goal. Yeah. It's going to take a few more years to get there, believe it or not. But um, so I do oversee the, the data governance implementation and making sure that different teams under data governance are doing what they're supposed to be doing. I can't imagine the complexity because again, you guys are a global company. What's it like trying to deal with the global compliance of all the different, because I remember like every group, sometimes group of countries, you have the EU, you have even just California has their own set of requirements, which some people might argue is another country in and of itself. But, I mean, there's so many different levels that you need to comply to. I can't imagine logistics and just planning out all those different things you got to do. What was like step one or that sounds like a, well, almost so, not insurmountable, but that's a tall yeah. order. So when we were implementing product data governance, um, basically one of the, the things, the conversations were very complicated because, or we're very kind of, we were going around in circles and not getting my, uh, anywhere because uh, we have so many different product development teams within the company all over the world, right? Um, we do products for, you know, we design and build and sell products for Imperial Armani or you know, lots of very well-known brands mm. in addition to Fossil Group, you know, Fossil Brand and uh, Zodiac, Michelle, you know, et cetera, Watch Station. Um, so we would all get all these different exceptions. Mm. And we're like, well, if you're building a product for this brand, it's on this system and, th- you know, and, you know, they use this, 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 but if it's like, if it's a watch, they do this, this, this. If it's a, if it's a letter bag, they do, oh, like, geez. Oh, so, you know, we were like being buried. Yeah. Uh, so we have to kind of like, with any big problem, right? You have to get simplify things. So you can't be able to be able to get to a place where you can actually get your hand on it before you want to. So I said, okay, fine, let's do this. Fossil group, watch. What does it take for us to be able to build and sell one on our website? Mm-hmm. Let's just do that data flow. Let's figure out which systems are involved. And, um, and you know which systems are involved, etc. So and by life cycle from from planning to you know post sale support. Yeah. So we basically put together this data flow diagram. I and can't imagine how how long of a diagram this is because I mean, everything is from design. Humongous. It's called the spaghetti diagram. Oh, really? In the company, <laughs> and I've been asked to even when I come back. Literally, I came back after a two year uh, departure. And people were asking, hey, do you have that spaghetti diagram for the product? You know, it, yeah. it was, cause they were like, it's a data flow diagram with like 55 or 80 boxes oh my on gosh. it. You know, and a lot of those boxes are like different systems. And we're like, and we're looking and going, this is insane. This is how, how complicated. That's why like a lot of uh, companies you hear and, you know, just imagine this is for, to be able to build design, you know, design, build and sell a watch. Mm-hmm. Um, just imagine you hear a lot of different companies uh, talk about how their product life cycle, uh, product cycles are like design cycles are like three to three years or five years, like car mm-hmm. companies, etc. cetera. Oh, right? yeah. And that's why, because they have so many systems involved, so many processes involved. So many that, components. Yeah. It's like nowadays a car is the minimum like 10,000 components. Like people don't realize how complex things are these days. I'm not sure if you have a car that simple nowadays, but... Uh- uh, what was it? I think it was a Ford article I was reading. Or well, no, Elon in an interview said that like, yeah. that was the average number of components in a vehicle. It's like for 10, for, for Tesla. I think and said Tesla. An, Tesla. I, think it, I thought I said an average vehicle. Tesla products are because they're designed ground up, right, to yeah. be electrical vehicles. Mm-hmm. They have fewer parts, and their margins are profit margins are significantly higher. Oh yeah. When uh, Ford did the <laughs> Lightning truck, or no Mustang, oh, the, kind of Mustang EV the, SUV, yeah, the bastardized, right? It's it Mustang in name only. Yeah, so, yeah the Mustang E Mach. Yeah, I think something yeah. like they have twelve miles of unneeded extra wiring in the product, and losing twelve thousand dollars every uh, every one that they were yeah, selling. Yeah, still now yeah. down to negative six thousand dollars. So maybe this year but it's make a profit. One of the worst selling products right now. One of yeah. the worst selling cars out there with the longest uh, sales, you know, t- sales cycle. They're yeah. collecting dust. 
on lots. But yeah, and yeah, because there Ford is that company. Literally, oh, they're yeah. used to doing their thing with you know fifty or whatever umpteen different processes and systems, etc. And um, so, so you know, to some degree, at Fossil, we kind of we were kind of like that because we've been our company around since nineteen, I believe, eighty four or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were, you know, and we were much bigger than we are now, and we we did realize at one point that wow, everything we were doing is so complicated. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and we did start um, all these different programs to, you know, simplify things. And, and because, uh, I mean, at one point we were laughing about it because in our IT group, <laughs> it, sound, it looked like if you, if you looked at between you know, Fossil IT and Asia Pacific, um, uh, in Europe and North America, uh, you know, there were three different, IT organizations almost at one point, and they were like there was very little controls, and they were allowed to buy whatever product, and then you know, yeah. At one point, it looked like any software product that a vendor could come up with, like it seemed like we already had it somewhere. <laughs> and it was crazy. It's just yeah. like how many different you know data integration tools do we need, or how many different you know BI tools we need, or how many different you know supply chain tools. It was like really, Does, is it, is this really a very efficient way to run things? It's yeah, like, obviously not. So, um, our IT side of the house have been working, you know, pretty hard for several years, uh, trying to simplify things and try to get rid of the know. rogue IT. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, cloud doesn't help, right? No, especially all employee needs a little credit card swipe and, oh yeah, here's another AWS instance, which depending on what your life cycle is for the company or what your thoughts are, or your ideals can cost a lot of money to get your data back. If you ever do want it back. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, SaaS software sales right it's oh, like yeah. you don't go to the it side of the house you go to you find somebody else in the business and go hey you know my software can fix your uh fix your problem and guess what your it doesn't have to be involved okay where do i sign <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm not saying that as a fossil group oh no that's maybe that's, there's a little bit of, might have been the, a little yeah. bit uh, you know of that in the old days but um we're, I, I would like to think that we're a much smarter company nowadays oh, yeah uh, but in the old days, a lot of companies, I mean, literally as a consultant, I would walk oh, yeah. into and, you know, when I'm asking this, oh, do you have this software, this software, this software? And it was always funny because I would ask the same questions to IT then I would find somebody in the business and I would ask the same questions to them mm-hmm. and I go, and then like when I would talk to the IT team again, I would go, did you guys, you know, know that you have X, Y, Z, you know, software in your company? And they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Makes the security team sit on the edge too. Like, oh yeah, we've got this product. It's totally secure. After they buy it, they're implementing. Hey, security team, can you help us out? What did you buy? Yeah. What? We can't host that here. Like, what? No. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I think you probably met some of the security guys in Fossil Group. Oh, yeah, uh, throughout the years. Yeah. Um, so... You know, first time around starting data governance as, as part of IT, this time around restarting data governance as part of the actual business, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty common actually for data governance within IT uh, from in major enterprises. It usually takes three tries to get it right. True. Or for it to take hold. And, <laughs> you know, um, the, but the major thing is both implementations. Uh, I'm good friends with compliance guys, yep. legal and security. Right, they, we all kind of work hand in hand. So yeah. and, and procurement. Well, that's so, important. You know, procurement, even on the business procurement side, they're doing something. And they'll go, hold on a minute, did Bora look at this, or you know, did I, you know, IT sec, infosec guys look at this? Like, did you do an infosec? It's like it's similarly, they'll go, you know, do, you, do did you go to legal and did you get the, you know, did you get the NDA yeah. sign? You know, yeah. it's like similarly, like, hey, did we do an infosec? Get Marty sign like, off on this? Yes, no. Does he know? Nah, better go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're all we're all kind of constantly going, pinging each other, going, "Hey, uh, we're at the software wonder. You know, somebody is trying to. Yeah. It's like, did this run through you guys? It's like, no, we haven't heard of it. Okay, interesting. Like, Good to know. Yeah, yeah, we're we're this like we're all hand in hand. We're tr- trying to you know keep all the ducks in a row because you have to. Because yeah. I mean, some product some products will be perfect for one department, but for the whole company, all of a sudden it could be a security th- flaw. It could be a, it could be a human thing. Sometimes the program right. you know doesn't work without departments, or people don't like it. So it really is one of those complex things: is making sure you find solutions that fit the whole company and whole ecosystem, not just one department. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I mean, enterprise IT is 
very complicated, very difficult, uh, just because of the scale of things. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, and, it, and it's interesting because, you know, take that, for example, Fossil, a global company, mm-hmm. versus when I was working at a startup, a software company, um, literally I would go, I would raise my, I was one of the top, you know, three technical leads in the company. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I would raise my hand and go, wait, our desktops are not getting backed up. It's like, what, back, what like software backup solution we have? Mm-hmm. And they would go, well, we don't. Oh gosh, that's a, oh, like, okay. That's I need to, I need to go figure out <laughs> one and buy one. It was like, okay, so who is the admin? It's like, well, we don't officially have one. Yeah. So guess what? You're now the admin. Oh, you gosh, know, yeah. <laughs> I know. Got to. I now I got to learn about all the different you know software backup tools and got to go implement it. And finally, you know, we got we grow up a little bit bigger as a company. Got an admin and. They were like, okay, so who's the, the system admin going to report? Oh, wow, they're going to, he's going to report to Bora because yeah. he knows, this, you know. He did it first. He knows the ecosystem. He knows the environment. So, um, yeah, but it was, it was kind of funny because it's like in a startup, it was, it was so much more simpler. Like oh, yeah. we had tiny little data center and, you know, uh, I knew every, every single server that was in there and, you know, we knew every single software, you know, compare that to. what well, we have an enterprise. It's kind of crazy. I can't, I can't imagine the amount of just raw data. That you guys process. I mean, just just a year of transactions alone. When you think of all the customer data, the customer preferences, that's got to be astronomical. Yeah, um, but they kind of pale in size to the Google Analytics data. Oh, really? Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, because uh, I mean, if you think about transactions, transactions by themselves are pretty small mm-hmm. uh, as far as data bits. Yeah, but website traffic and like every because obviously if you go to anybody's website right oh, yeah. every single thing that you do what you look at what you see what you click on those are all getting logged oh yeah in the google you know logs mm-hmm. um google analytics logs and those things get pretty large oh, i can imagine um, and then if you try to do and a big portion of the traffic is obviously uh, "quote unquote" anonymous, uh, but some of it is not. Especially if you you know create an account or if you do a transaction, etc. Right now, now what, it's got a profile what, for you. Yeah, what yeah. was an anon- what was anonymous before is now not because you know you literally did just enter your pres- you know email address or whatever. Um, so if you take that data and you kind of like do a playback, right, mm-hmm. trying to figure out. Hey, what did they see? You know, what did they click on? You know, what led them to actually put something in cart and check out? And, you know, when you're looking at all that, that's a lot of data. And, you know, some of our UI guys are doing that, uh, right? Just because they're trying to see, they're, they're, everybody is trying to improve. Like all those cookies, especially the Google Analytics ones, that's the, kind of the reason for it because they're trying to make sure that, hey, like checkout didn't take you an extra minute and a half, right? They're trying to optimize all of this thing so that everything is, you know, hey, can the, where the customer came in looking for X and we're able to find it because, yep. you know, at one point we had like 350 different fossil watches on fossil.com. Oh, wow. So, 350? Yeah, at one point. I, I'm hoping that wow. we're a little bit lower nowadays. So yeah. uh, uh, but um, so, you know, on your website, you got to be able to, like help the customer figure out which one is the right one for them. Right. So, you know, you're looking at all this, um, you know, especially the UI guys are looking at all this and they're looking at, you know, single sessions, et cetera. Well, when you do it at a macro level, right, because you're trying to figure out like, what's my average load time, da, 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 you're not blowing out that data set because it's huge. Right. That's why, yeah. you know, we have Google's BigQuery, you right? know, like all the data goes into BigQuery and you can build dashboards and trying to figure out like, one of the reasons why AI is so popular, right? Because the data sets were getting so large that for normal analysts, it was too difficult to be able to manage, figure out the gems within the data, mm-hmm. right? To be able to ask the right questions and see the right, you know, the uh, see the right takeaways. Yeah. Uh, obviously, AI can do that significantly better. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, uh, again, AI doesn't always doesn't have common sense. So it yeah. doesn't see some of the things that should be outliers, should be ignored, et cetera, right? So, yeah. oh, my most favorite, you know, well, the, the most favorite product is packaging. 
Yeah. No, not really. People are not <laughs> buying packaging. It's just because it's, it's packaging it's, is a skew yeah. that gets added to it's, every product. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you have to. Right. So yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's been a, it's been very interesting, and it's been retail IT is kind of. I've been in a lot of different industries, and and retail IT is different, uh, especially because it is so heavily consumer facing and consumer. You know, you have consumer facing, so the behavior and point of sale systems, behavior on websites, behavior in customer care, on marketing systems, you know, it's all so, you know, human facing. So it is difficult uh, because there's a lot of different data bits and there's a lot of ways people can screw things up to some degree when you're inputting data or, you know. Um, so uh, at the back end, it, it does become very interesting trying to make sure that you can standardize and clean and make that data presentable, uh, and then store it in a way that is actually compliant, right? Yep. And efficient. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, at some point, like, do you really need a customer who haven't interacted with you in the last seven years? Do you really need <laughs> their data still? Yep. Right. You know, some company, uh, one of the data data governance things is like my data. Yeah. Everybody wants to hang on their data. <laughs> like, I can't let go of that data. That's valuable. I'm like, yeah, yeah but then uh, that customer is never going to come back. Because yeah. you've been trying for seven years for them to come back and buy something from me. Something significantly changed. Right. Like, So, yeah, they maybe they uh, completely, you know, they're more of a Rolex customer now, not a fossil watch customer potentially, right? So, yeah. uh, they told you, you know, five years ago, they opted out and they haven't, or they haven't clicked on anything. And, you know, uh, it's like, why are you hanging on to that data? Because if God forbid there's a breach or something, now you have one more record uh, that like, you're responsible for. Yeah. Like, do you really want to do that? Or do you really want to implement some kind of retention policy so that or the CEO is going to be like, but Bora, I read an article and the most valuable asset on the planet in, what was it? 2020 was data is more valuable than oil, gold, and pharmaceuticals. So that means we have to keep that customer data from eight or 12 years ago, maybe? It's like, eh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is and those are like one of the things that we have recently done over the last few years is like we started quantifying what the value of internal value of consumer data and bits of consumer data, like so that we can actually justify some of the business processes because. Uh, as much as SaaS products make things easy to store and process consumer data, mm-hmm. similarly, a lot of them have some kind of licensing terms or restrictions. So oh, yeah. if you're trying to store 100 million customer records, you're paying a lot more in licensing. Oh, yeah. uh, do you really need to do that when, you know, let's say after 100 million, 50 million is not going to interact with you again. Yeah. Well, I was right. going to say the gold business rule, the 80, 20 rule, you know, 20% of your, 80% of your results will come from 20% of your sales or something to that effect. It seems something to be a pretty, pretty standard rule of thumb for most industries. It's similarly, you're, you're going to apply the same thing to products. Like, yep. you know, you're making 80% of your product uh, money from 20% of your product. Precisely. Usually. Do, usually. You, do you need 300 plus watches when, you know, the top, let's say 50 or 60 are a majority of where the profit and the revenue comes from. And the other skew is so maybe only 10 or 20 people are buying it and they like it, which you can debate the life cycle value of maybe that will convert that customer into buying another fossil accessory, which of course increases the value, which of course probably gets into AI analytics of behavior. Like what should we recommend this customer based on what they previously purchased, which right. I'm sure that, that's a whole science in and of itself, getting yep. that right. Cause if you get it wrong, the customer gets annoyed. Why am I seeing this pop up? I don't care about this set. Like, this product well, has nothing to do with me. It's spam. Like right. how do you get those right too? Yeah. I mean, you have 380, you know, 350 different watches. And, yep. you know, if it's going to take too long to be able to find the one that they're really looking for, they might just get, you know, lose attention, and go find it on Amazon and, yep. you know, look at somebody else or something. Right. So, exactly. yeah. And that, that's exactly like if we figure it out long time ago, we figured it out. Uh, we have more than 350 watches. Oh my gosh. And we figured out that, Hey, a uh, big percentage of these, we're end up liquidating only, uh, you know, some percentage of our of them are make, making real money. Mm-hmm. So, um, not only did we, and then as part of the analytics, the uh, I'm now part of the overall global analytics umbrella, and I report to a very smart gentleman, uh, MIT trained, you know, smart gentleman. Mm-hmm. Uh, under his leadership, like we have, not only did we started implementing a lot more smarter things around like what products actually work well, what products we should be selling, etc. We started incorporating 
consumer feedback early in the design process before the product is actually created. Oh, really? And yeah, which actually is, it's all about trying to build the products that consumers want, obviously, right? Because the, the let's say you're, let's say we have 350 watches, yep. but consumers really only like 50 of them, yep. creating the 300 other SKUs, building them, sourcing them, yeah, designing them, building them, sources them, et cetera. Huge amount of money. Oh, yeah? Wasted. So. And, of course, you don't want to, depending on the kind of the company's perception around, you know, decreasing the quality or the perceived value of the company, you don't want to sell them for pennies on the dollar to, you know, the secondhand market or you don't want You're to. your brand. Exactly. Wow. So, and no one wants to do the Atari thing where they had to, what is it, they buried like 200, or no, is it 2 million of the ET cartridges in the middle of a dumpster? Oh, like, I, yeah, I don't remember during, the video, that, but, yeah. during the video game crash, they had all those worthless ET cartridges. They literally just sent them all to the landfill and it became myth and legend until they, you know, re you know, dug them up a couple years ago. Wow. But yeah, they're like, eh. well, they were also doing pretty bad at the time, too. But yeah, that people say that video game was the one that contributed to the video game crash of the 80s was ET on the Atari 2600. I didn't know that. That's it's like, yeah, imagine if you had all that left over. Mm -hmm. all those watches like well then there's a cost associated to bearing it and of course consumers aren't going to like that these days because i would say on average they're much more conscientious of like the environmental impact and be like, well why are you wasting time and resources you, you're bearing this and obviously depending on the recycle process it's going to be a headache in and of itself because a lot of them will contain lithium and well that's, more that's <laughs> interesting that you said so yeah. because you know we're, we're, let's let's look at different watches we have right i have a automatic watch from one of uh uh, company Zodiac, which is owned by Fossil Group. Uh, I think they've been making watches in Switzerland since 1884 or something like that. Oh, really? Right. Uh, and then you have a smartwatch, right? Yeah. Well, and, it's kind of a dumb watch, but it works. <laughs> well, you know, and Fossil Group used to be one of the largest makers of Android watches in the world at one point. Um, but so let's say this watch should work. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have batteries. It's an automatic, right? Yeah. Um, with minimal maintenance, this watch should work 100 years from now, oh, yeah. right? Um, so we had a lot of different iterations of Android OS or Wear OS or whatever they're called nowadays. Oh, yeah. Um, geez, they're obsolete in a year. Like, yeah. Uh, and, and it, you know? And then where do they end up? Landfills. <laughs> and it's... I think it's the same issue that car companies had when they're trying to do the navigation devices. That's why, to this day, a navigation device inherently in most vehicles is rudimentary at best. And because they realize the best thing to do, because every consumer nowadays in the US, especially, has a smartphone, just have it mirror the smartphone. You don't have to do the research and development because. Except the GM. GM actually recently went on record saying, the GM's uh, CEO saying that we're not going to do Wear OS or Apple Play integration anymore. They're just, we're just going to be investing in our own. You know, own navigation in you know entertainment. Yeah, we know how well that worked out last time. It's not going to work out that much better this time. Yeah, they've only gone bankrupt three times since Billy Durant founded the company with Oldsmobile and Buick all those years ago. And uh, yeah, Mary Barrow thought they wanted to go all in on EV, and then well, that shot him in the foot because the biggest confu the biggest growing segment for consumer preferences in the United States is hybrids. So uh, they uh, maybe they'll get it right this time. Maybe, but like. On average, that's why we see so many car companies just have a mirror of the smartphone. Because, mm -hmm. again, you already have that technological marvel in your pocket, usually made by um, mm -hmm. Samsung or Apple. Why not mirror it? But yeah, with with the smart watches, unless you're Apple or Samsung, it's, it just obsolete so quick. And I was going to say, I like my Garmin just because it's darn near bulletproof. It'll last darn near forever. Mm -hmm. And it's not. it does like, tell me if I get a text message, but like, it's not like a fancy screen. It'll, the charge will last a fair amount of time. But... Yeah, at the end of the day, this thing will go bad because it has a lithium battery, you know, built into it. And unfortunately, based on you know how electronics are made these days, it's it's all glued together. Right. So it's not realistically serviceable. Technically, sure. But that's the nice thing about mechanical watches is yeah, they last hundred years plus. Right. Just need to every once in a while pay a professional to actually maybe take it apart and clean it a little bit. But and that's the self winding one too. So all you have to mm -hmm. do is move around to today, right, for uh, your watch storage. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And this one is from twenty. 15 oh really or 2016 and it has never been serviced looks still looks new it's and, awesome and it's been knocking wood it's been working well i have uh another one i have one of the titanium die watches from them that i wore literally around the world multiple times oh really and uh, for several years that one hasn't been serviced in years and it still yeah. works fine so um especially if they're sealed and you know i know there's the whole the oils in them and or the gears, whatever, mm. evaporating, et cetera. You know, there's, yeah. But I mean, 
it doesn't take the same uh it, it's much cheaper to service zodiac than it is to do the same for a rolex oh i yeah i can't mention yeah. the service bill on the rolex i mean those <laughs> the reputation oh I, I, they're fantastical engineering i think as far as i know it's one of the only modern products you can buy where they don't have a supply chain they buy raw materials they make everything in-house which is impressive and the, of course they have artists that work there mm. but yeah i can't imagine just the cleaning bill on like a rolex submarin submariner like she's louise it's yeah it's gotta be, be pretty surprised pretty it's as much as buying a zodiac but you know. <laughs> but, um they're a great nonprofit. you gotta love them <laughs> fun fact yeah here. i mean when <laughs> exactly we're not we're not exactly you know it's funny because Zod uh the rolex uh u.s headquarters is in in dallas yeah uh, i was gonna say and but we're not exactly competitors right yeah. i mean we do have a couple of luxury watches michelle and michelle and zodiac uh but um yeah obviously they're not in the same well it's a different product as, category too. yes yeah. exactly i mean they're very you know high-end luxury watches oh yeah and to some degree, they sell themselves versus, you know, obviously. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've never seen a commercial for them. I know they sponsor some fancy sports balls and, like, racing events, but, like, I've never seen a commercial on the YouTube for them, like, because they don't really have to. Yeah. Maybe uh, I'm wrong. Maybe I've, yeah, have you ever I've seen, seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of uh, Rolex uh, really? commercials on TV. Oh, uh, I don't have a TV. Uh, okay, so maybe that's why. Or, <laughs> you know, programs. But, yeah, and then the funny thing is then, but, I mean, on, like, a good quartz movement, especially, like, a Japanese quartz movement. And, yeah. You know, with full disclosure, Hustle Group does buy good quartz movements from right. some Japanese and some Chinese companies, and et cetera, for, for quartz watches. And uh, but I mean, accuracy wise, yes, uh, they're amazing, <laughs> especially for you know a a core uh, that costs a fraction of an uh, automatic watch, uh -huh. right? Uh, they will last uh, and they they keep time really well. It's just you know you're well, gonna have to keep. Replacing the battery in it every two years. Well, that's, uh -huh. that's the funny thing. It's I, I don't know if it's ironic, but they're they're more accurate. So if you spend five dollars on a you know quartz movement watch over at Walmart, it'll be more accurate than a ten thousand dollar Rolex, just because the quartz technology is just inherently that much better than a, a mechanical moving device. That is true. And it's one that of those is, funny. Th yeah, that is very much true. Uh, <laughs> especially as you know, and and yeah, so, and all automatic movements are not equal either. Of course, right? Yeah. Like. Um, for example, even within the Zodiac brand, we have some that are the Swiss uh, COC uh, certified ones, you know. Uh, but yeah, there there's a reason why the, the movement in this thing costs. Well, so also because it's because made in Switzerland, everything oh, yeah. is more exp expensive in Switzerland. True. Um, uh, yeah, why it costs so much, you know, hundredfold, almost. I don't know uh, the exact numbers right now, but uh, as a quartz one, but you know. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's just like cars, right? Like people will oh, yeah. ask me, "Oh, what's the best watch?" It's like, okay. it's like <laughs> for what <yeah>. application? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same with cars. Like, yeah. you know, a, a basic Kia or Toyota gets you from point A to point B, but as you yeah. find out, you know, on the, in the racetrack, it's oh, yeah. very different, right? Absolutely. So, similarly, people ask me a lot, you know, uh, what's the best gun? What's the best knife? You know, it's the like, well, well, okay. What do you need then, it for? <laughs> do, you, do you need a car that hit a million miles? You're going to get a Toyota. Do you, right. do you want to be, have the fastest car in the world and you still want a gas engine? You're going to get, you know, well, the Dodge Challenger, the send off edition is 060, 1.66 seconds. Granted, it's on a drag strip. As long as you don't have to turn. Yes, that's exactly. Oh, who, <laughs> it's a muscle car. That's unnecessary. Why, what do you even think about that for? But it's so true. It's all about the education application. It was, I watched a business documentary on Rolex a couple of years ago. It was kind of funny. They their, their first foray into technology watches was the big LED craze. Was mm -hmm. was in the eighties when they had the breakthrough technology. I remember Hewlett Packard. I think they invented the LED, but it got to the price point was basically nothing, relatively speaking. So everyone had LED watches. Rolex tried that. It tanked the sales to basically nothing because just the perception of the brand. Like, was it more accurate than you know a movement? Of course, yes, infinitely, just based inherently on that technology. But their sales crashed so bad, and they realized people want craftsmanship. They want a symbol of luxury status, and they've been making mechanical watches ever since. I, I forget if there was a rumor or confirmed that they have a technology partnership to have a smart Rolex watch, which, hmm. I don't know, to me, I don't, I don't know. I know businesses have to evolve and change over time, but part of the things that make Rolex a stable brand is like the Submariner, or Submariner, so I know, I obviously don't own one, own one, I can't pronounce it, but I mean, that design is pretty much the same for decades. Like. So it'll be interesting to see if we see ultra luxury brands get into technology watches when we were saying earlier, inherently just based on tech, they're disposable. 
the life cycle is not going to last as long. I mean, it'll be more convenient because you see your text messages and all the magical technology you have on your wrist. I understand the health benefits, you know, your heart rate. And I see the upside, but oh, for certain watches, I almost think it is a piece of craftsmanship because we also have smartphones too. We don't need a watch mm -hmm. most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's uh, and I mean I was I was part of our testing uh, for multiple generations of the Wear OS Android, uh, but after a while, I literally went back to wearing a standard, you know, a normal watch because yeah. I literally did not want another chargeable device yeah. buzzing and beeping <laughs> on my. It was enough that I had it on my, you know, on my phone. Yeah. Uh, I didn't need it on my wrist, and not, I was I didn't need to be debt plugged in, right? Yeah. It's just, uh, and I didn't need one more device to be charged, or one you know, or to worry about you know whatever battery level. It's just, well, just uh, just like IT, there's more variables that can go wrong. You have more complexities introduced to the environment or the ecosystem yeah. being your fashion yeah. apparel. Yeah, I mean it's the it's I always had that um, when we were teaching when I was teaching in Accenture and following companies when we were teaching our data architects. Uh, one of the major things that we were teaching was KISS uh, principle. Keep yeah. it simple, stupid. Exactly. You know, the, the more complex the system you're going to design, the more difficult it's going to be built and the more diff difficult it's going to be to maintain. And, you know, the more bugs you're going to have, the more, you know, points of failure. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and it's kind of interesting because we were talking about how the backend systems um, – for like enterprise IT, there are so many different systems. Well, each point of integration between those systems is a point of failure. Exactly. It's like, and that's why we have, you know, monitoring tools and, you know, but it's like, okay, so you, now you got to implement monitoring tools. So it's like, well, who monitors the monitoring tools? Yep, exactly. <laughs> then it's more kind of like Splunk, like some of the tools, you have the best tool on the planet, but you need the resources to properly support it. Like I always tell people like for Splunk, yeah, it's awesome. Like Pier 1 used to use them. They also had three guys. That was, that was all their job was you know, all day long was maintaining that tool. So I was, again, kind of like, what's the best knife? What's the best watch? It really just matters, you know, what's your use case? What's your environment? Because, again, for certain use cases, it's going to be a terrible decision for your company or for your personal life, depending on what product you're looking at. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, similar thing with cars, right? Like, oh, yeah. you're going shopping. Like, do you really need the Mustang E-Mac or whatever that thing is? No one needs that. With, <laughs> with so many uh, features, right? Yeah. It's like, okay. You know, it's funny because, like, as a technology architect, I've been, you know, I've been a certified technology arch uh, architect from my old, you know, Accenture days. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a lot. Of, I don't have Alexa in my house. I don't have a lot of home automation. Oh yeah. Because I know all of those things aside from the security. Oh yeah, that's concerns, that, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, all of those things are like another point of failure, another thing yep. to maintain. Uh, it's like. I already do that at work enough. I don't need that <laughs> to live with that in the house. I'm like I don't, I don't need my all my lights and my refrigerator and whatever else to be all connected. Yeah. And like, you look at the data logs. Like, why the hell does my LG washing machine use fifty gigs of data? What? Like, really? So yeah, I'm right. yeah. Ironically, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I kind of like to have little tech around me when I'm at home. Even though, ironically, I do work in tech. It's like I'm also one of the last one percent of Americans who still want a manual transmission, no matter what. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll draw the line of that I, I'll, I'll you know i'll take my you know I, I like fucking cars i mean my brother uh retired from a car company oh really um you know i, I like cars and everything but it's uh it's kind of funny i i own sports cars mm -hmm. got lots of speeding tickets on the sports cars um and then you know now i'm like what is the most functional car that i can uh, have mm -hmm. That is not going to be a pain in the ass to maintain. Yeah, that's why I don't drive a Mercedes anymore. <laughs> uh, and but it's going to be fun to drive, oh, yeah. which is not exactly easy because, like, on one hand, I want to be really practical, get like a million miles per gallon. Yeah. But then on the other hand, I have an all-wheel drive uh, Mini. Yeah, yeah. That has an aftermarket chip on it. You know. It's nice. Like, so I did give up a little bit of overgrowth mileage, but it's a little yeah. bit more zippy. Oh, does it really? You know, do you have to have zippy? Okay, ask the people who are buying Ferraris, right? Yeah, it's like right. Ferrari doesn't have to do marketing; they no. sell. I think they have an F1 team, and I'm trying to think if they ever actually have a sponsor, like or like, do they ever do any real marketing in terms of like consumer marketing, like with commercials? The only time I've why? seen it, oh, why, why? Why do they need it? It's, they it, don't. It's, they have a wait every, list. Every car, yeah, exactly. Every, I mean, people are dying to be able to buy their products, and, oh, yeah. and similarly, like Rolex doesn't have that problem. They, oh, yeah. People are dying to. So, but 
but you know we're talking about if a you know if a fifty dollar Walmart or whatever twenty five dollar Walmart watch mm -hmm. technically does the same thing as a as a Rolex and better technically <laughs> you know why do we have you know, you can go to any Walmart and, you know, they'll have watches that have been sitting there for hundreds of days. Oh, that's going right? to be stressful. Yeah. Uh, versus you can't buy a Rolex, nope. right? Um, Especially oh. when the pandemic hit, those things became, they increased by value like 20, 30%. It was yeah. insane. Similarly, we're talking about, you know, uh, some Dodge Chrysler, what are Stellantis, uh, and Ford cars sitting on the lots for, oh, yeah. some of them are hitting a year. Which is hell because yeah. a lot of people don't realize the dealerships don't own it. They're, it's a floor plan, so they're paying interest on those cars. They don't own them outright. Right. So, so those costs are adding up. They're sitting on the lots versus the Ferrari dealership. They have right. like three cars in the, for you to look at. Well, Ferrari, you have to buy like the entry level vehicle before you can get the quote unquote rights to buy the like the the one you really want. Right. Like that's one that's one of the best examples of branding and culture I've seen from a business perspective. Is I mean Ferrari, they take their brand very seriously. It's very exclusive. You gotta be all in on it. I mean, which I would think you kind of argue is kind of the inception of Ferrari himself. Yeah, it's kind of his personality too. And then you also have just to put, you know, just to just position to that. You have Lamborghini. You just, you know, they don't give a shit. If you got money, walk your Lamborghini, get whatever you want. Like, yeah, <laughs> and I mean, they'll, you can and, customize it however yeah, you want. There, there are companies <laughs> that are designed, you know, started with different uh, principles. Oh, yeah, very different, um, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, at Fossil, we actually have, you know, a program that is all about, you know watch on wrist like we're yeah. we're hey you bought a fossil watch you're not happy with it like you go to a fossil store they'll you know they'll be they'll work really hard to make you happy and they'll you know to exchange it for one that you're you, you like and that's working etc like it's a it's for us it's, that's a big deal right absolutely like, it's comp part of the company culture uh it's the um but you, you know again it's like okay so is Rolex going to try that hard? No, you're going to go in and they're going to go, oh, yeah, that will be uh, whatever amount. Eight, it to, is. eight to 12 grand. Uh, well, that's what to, used to be well, say, Mariner. Well, let's say you have a Rolex watch, but you go in and you're going to, oh, well, yeah, I bought this like a year and a half ago. It's not keeping time. Well, guess what? We're going to, you know, you're going to pay us X number $100 or whatever it is now to but, service it. Do you like, hear about it, the Joe Rogan interview with that? Do so Joe, during Joe Rogan, he had one of his podcasts where they brought up the topic of watches. And he goes, yeah, you know, my watch is great, but it's not that accurate. And he's talking to Elon about it. And he goes, yeah, he went to Rolex store. He said, hey, you know, after a couple months, this is about five minutes ahead. And the Rolex representative goes, yeah, they do that. And they, he got, Joe's like, can you fix it? He's like, no, they just do that. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just kind of built into it. You just kind of accept it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, go Fossil, they're going to take care of you and they're going to actually fix it. Yeah. Which is pretty rare, especially these days, and especially important because, you know, every study since... You know, for decades, will tell you it costs, you know, seven to eight times more to get a customer back than to get a customer to begin with. It is so difficult. And just having a good brand actually takes care of employees and takes care of people. I mean, you, I think nowadays you especially have to have that because every, pretty much every industry is so hyper competitive. Right. I mean, right. there's startups in every product category these days. I mean, Timu is taking over the fashion industry in a lot of ways. They spent like almost $2 billion in marketing last year. And it's a little bit of a unique business model, but I mean, they're growing like a weed and trying to compete. And I don't know. I mean, mm. I'm definitely not the fashion person to talk to you. I mean, in terms of apparel, I got one or two suits and make them last a lifetime. But <laughs> yeah, which is which is kind of interesting because like um, first time I got into Fossil Group uh, uh, back in 2014, um, I just kind of stumbled on it. And I was retail fashion was one that I didn't work in before. So it was kind of interesting. And, you know, I got the tour for the company and was like, oh, this is very, this is like a place that I would like to work in. And, yeah. you know, as a consultant and otherwise, I worked with a lot of companies and I was, I was struggling at the time. Like, I really kind of, I put a lot of myself into my work. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work at a company that, like, I felt like, you know, it mattered and you know, I cared, right? And, yeah. and I knew with retail industry, it was, it was kind of, uh, a little bit of a risky thing to go uh, into. So, but I liked the culture so much that, you know, ended up going to work at Fossil Group. Yeah. Um, which turned out accurate because, like, I got laid off uh, late 2019 uh, from Fossil IT mm -hmm. as part of, you know, the LT layoffs that they were having. All pandemic um, hitting. Yep. Well, this was actually about six months before pandemic. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I was lucky enough. It was two weeks later I was working, well, 
about three weeks later, I was working at a uh, at a different company called uh, Freeman uh, Company. That's uh, right. events company. The events company. They are yep. the biggest event company in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and I was in charge of their enterprise data. Um, another great company, by the way. Uh, Culture wise, if you're within the company, great people. Um, I can't say enough positive things about them. Um, and they treated me, to, treated me with respect. And um, when we were going, to, unfortunately, the quarter that we were supposed to have our uh, record revenues is when COVID hit and our revenues went to almost zero. And, pe- and for people who don't know about the company, they do logistics and organization executions for, you know, these large public venues, you know, all the back end stuff to get it set up physically and re-prepare for it. Yeah, from like Republican, you know, na- national Congress or whatever. Yeah, the RNC uh, convention. Like, yeah. Yeah. To the, I remember. To SHOT Show. Yeah. And I think it was even, was it, was it, uh, what was it? Yeah. I think they can't, the E, not E3, E5. I'm thinking about Microsoft now. The, um, mm-hmm. it used All to be really this. popular for, this. um, IT tech events, the conference yeah. every year, E3. Yep. That was yeah. it, right? Yeah. The, they canceled it permanently, though, I think, in 20, last yeah. year. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. I mean, any, any of the major events where, yeah. you know, Freeman was behind it. Um, so it was definitely fun. It was definitely another industry that I haven't part of. So it was kind of cool. But, you know, 80% of the company got laid off within yeah. a matter of a few months because of, you know, COVID. Because all the events were shut down. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, we had uh, Salesforce and Microsoft and uh, you know, all the major companies. Yeah. They were con- canceling out, uh, you know, in-person events two years out. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, but again, um, so again, a couple of years after that, uh, when I got the call uh, from Fossil to come back, um, for, and I was like, yeah, I'm not sure about coming back to Fossil IT. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were like, no, 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 the business needs you. Like, they need you to, because you, you know our data, you know where, you know, yeah. you, know where, you know where our data is. Yeah. We need you to create a data engineering team that allows the business to be able to utilize our data much more efficiently. Yeah. Because uh, to be honest with you, IT was so concentrated on keeping the systems up mm. and they didn't own the data technically because you always say business owns the data. Yeah. Oh, it's not that simple. Like you still have to understand like where the data is and how you utilize it, you know, all the nuances. Mm. Like they didn't have a lot of people that was looking at that, which meant that whenever the business had a need, which they do around like how to work smarter, how to have fewer products and how to sell to consumers. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. um, they were, they were always struggling because trying to figure out what's the right source of the data, how, you know, um, and that's why my treatment team was created and that's why they want to bring me back. And, uh, I was kind of looking at it. Like, I know they've been, you know, uh, COVID was not the kind to fossil group. Neither was Apple watch. Yeah. Um, so, you know, on one hand, I was like, really, do I want to go back to that industry when it's, you know, in so much flux? Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was like, well, I, re- you know, my wife reminded me, like, you always loved working with the people there. Like, you loved working for the company. It's, it's a company culture. And yep. um, again, another company who treated me really well when they were laying me off. I mean, uh, there's some companies that I, over the years I left or laid off, like, there's no way I would ever go back to, to that. But yeah. Apparently, Fossil Group is the first company that I actually went back to and, uh, and, and enjoyed it last two and a half years. Uh, definitely. It's a, the, I have the team, aside from the data governance team, I have the team of data engineers. That are, our mission is to be able to enable the rest of the business. Um, and we've done well, and it's been fun. I was going to say, it's an iconic brand and a great team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, uh, great people. Uh, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those people, uh, companies where like our CEO doesn't have a jet, you know, yeah. he doesn't have a giant office. Like my cube is, you know, literally like right around the corner from our CEOs, yeah. uh, you know, um, CFO, COOs, they're like, their offices are over there and they're not giant offices. Like, yeah. you know, in the middle of, and they're not corner offices. They're like in the middle of the company and, you know, they're integral and open door font policy. Like, I can walk, I can walk in and go, yeah, did you realize we're doing X, Y, Z? And they'll actually listen. And, and, and the funny thing is, especially with our, um, you always hear about like large enterprises where the top doesn't have a clue what's going on. Yep. Um, I can literally walk in and go, Hey, you know, that watch da, 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 you know, not selling or, you know, like we have this issue. Like if I did that to our CEO, again, global company, yeah. he'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and because he's so 
ingrained and you know he's very uh hands-on he's not a he's not a you know empty empty suit uh, it, that's, so. that's the best that's i think that's what, those are the most successful companies too when you have everyone that invested and everyone's really they're not just there for a paycheck they really do have that open door policy and they want the critical feedback because i always tell people the most valuable feedback you'll ever get in life is critical because especially because it's usually so rare right especially in corporate America when, you know, everyone wants to look their best. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. But I mean, I mean shoot, sometimes you need to, because I mean, you, gotta, you want to improve, you, gotta, you need the truth to build the company up bigger and better and stronger. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, and, uh, yeah, we, we definitely have that culture where we value everybody in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there is, yeah. I mean, you're not going to get uh, penalized for delivering bad news. Mm-hmm. You're going to, you will get quote unquote penalized for, being very ugly and doing it, mm-hmm. you know, because you're not respecting other people. That that actually yeah. gets a lot of attention within the company. We, we we'll say that we don't have a lot of a holes in yeah. the company uh, because we don't. I mean, that's like part of the culture. It's like it's how, somehow it's there. We don't usually tolerate it. So, yeah. which is kind of cool. Uh, again, absolutely, it's a place where you know, even though I had my reservations uh, because of the same week I had like kind of offers from two other companies oh, wow. and I was like, eh, well, you know, and one of them was one of the companies, I would have made a lot more money, but yeah. I knew the company culture was very cutthroat. And it was like, yeah. do I really want to go to that? And, or do I want to go to the company that like, I, I know and like the people and, you know, I, and I went back and it was, you know, I walked in and everybody was like, so happy to see me. It's like, it, it's kind of nice to be able to work somewhere where people are, Happy to see you. Right? Definitely. How it's vindicating like, was that first day when everyone just remembered you? And if, do you feel just like you're, like yeah. you're coming home? Yeah, it, it was pretty amazing. Um, pretty much every meeting I walked into, people were like, "Oh my God, you're back! We're so happy to see you." It's like that's a, obviously a great feeling, right? It's, it's a big family. So um, there were only like one or two people in the company who weren't happy to see me, and they're oh, all really? gone. They're all gone. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, and that was part of the overall. Still, as an enterprise, right? Like we're getting more and more obviously me coming back to the company is a big sign of how much more data driven that we are right True. because we're investigating investing in um and it's all part of the transformation of the culture of the company mm. we're a very creative company um so creative companies are typically not you know especially artistic or creative companies are typically not as data driven right mm. and you know that's what i've been seeing uh, since 2014 within the company like the transformation of the company culture to be a lot more data driven. All right. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we have to work smarter. And the only way you're going to work smarter is when you're going to be more, much more data driven. Like I said, like we're integrating consumer feedback into product design mm. up, up front so that we don't waste all that money building products that they don't want. So Absolutely. You know, maybe it's a sign that we're not making a lot of smartwatches nowadays because maybe people don't want them. Well, I was going to say, I mean, anecdotally speaking, like when I was a kid growing up, like I was, I was see all the brand procession. I saw a fossil for being cool because of the extraordinarily neat watch uh, mechanisms, you know, watches you can get at, at an affordable price point. Like, cause everyone had the cool mechanical watches and it was a fossil. I mean, it was the thing. Yeah. And then, you know, we still have them. Um, I have one of the, the Batman ones. Yeah. That, that's a cool collab. I, 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 I like yeah. I, I love the, the collab ones. Um, we had a recently, uh, Disney watch, Mickey Mouse watch. I ended up buying a Mickey Mouse watch. I, I, you know, as a 47 year old, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. And I'm wearing it, you know, uh, that was one of the cool ones. Um, we do watches for diesel. Uh, oh, yeah. diesel is a pretty cool brand, obviously. Mm-hmm. And they are one of our great partners when it comes to design. They, uh, you know, our designers, I'm sure really like working with them because mm-hmm. they, uh, they're one of those companies that like push us to, Hey, you know, we're an Angie brand and we need something a little bit, you know, we don't need the same thing that everybody, you know. Yeah, we don't want the same, we only yeah. want the same second hand from another watch. We want something completely ground oh, up. Different. I think there is one that looks like an alien. I don't know if you've seen it. Oh, one no, I haven't. I just checked Diesel out. watches that we designed. Yeah. Uh, that it's kind of like really reminiscing of the, you know, el- it kind of looks uh, organic, you know, alien black. It, it's just, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that was one of the pretty cool ones. And I know, like you were saying earlier, there's no such thing as a perfect car, a perfect watch for, you know, what's the, but what's your favorite, maybe fossil watch or maybe like for a work occasion? Is it the one you're wearing now or if you had to keep one? Uh, it would be the, um, 
It will be the titanium one. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, titanium die watch. Uh, I think it's titanium sea dragon. I think that's the from Zodiac. Um, I literally traveled with that all over the world, uh, multiple times around the world. Oh, really? Uh, and been to from Bora Bora to Hong Kong to to you know Spain to Z, you know Zurich to you know all sorts of places, and, and that's like it weighs nothing. It it, it works well. Um, yeah, that's that's probably if I had to keep one, that would be it. And I don't yeah. ever like I think I owned it since 2016, and I haven't you know don't have to change the batteries. So you know. Has it, have you ever even had to take it in for service or still rock, you know, just rocking and rolling hard? Uh, it hasn't been serviced since 2016. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. And it still keeps time accurately. So There you go. You know, there's something to be said about the Swiss, right? Yeah, absolutely. Know. Well, I was going to say, there's a reason so many watches are way, made. I mean, it's iconic just to look at a watch you see Swiss made on it more often right. than not, especially for mechanical watches too. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then, yeah, Swiss and the Japanese, they know how to make, you know, Products. Uh, what what is the term I heard the other day? Buy it for life or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was seeing. I think it's B I F L. Was the yeah. oh, I was looking at the acronym. I was like, what is that? Buy it for life. Oh, okay. Well, you know. That, if that's not a toy dog commercial, that's such a lost opportunity. Like, <laughs> which is funny because like um you know so I guess you know that's one of my favorite hobbies is competitive shooting. So yeah. um I used to be a firearms instructor a long time ago before I got into competitive shooting. Um, I, uh, one of my friends is, you've probably seen him on the History Channel. He's a military historian uh, from Fort Benning, I believe. Um, he, uh, and he has a huge collection. He handed me a culturally significant uh, rifle one time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a 1917 Mauser. Oh, really? From, made in Oldendorf, Germany. Uh, it, was, it happened to have the Ottoman markings on it. It was used by Ottoman Empire in First World War One. Oh, my gosh. Um, and... So, okay, uh, so I'm like looking at it, you know, all the amazing, you know, the craft, even for something so utilitarian, the craft yeah. with the wood and the metal and, the, you know, it was pretty cool looking, you, you, you know, it's a bolt action, you, you kind of work the, the action, it's still super smooth and everything. And, uh, and he, you know, he had his own private range. Oh, um, nice. It was back when I lived in the East Coast. So... And he's like, all right, go shoot. Okay, well, okay. Uh, there's a six-inch gong at 300 yards. It's like... 300? Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, okay, really? Uh, all right, well, I don't think I've ever shot at something that far, let alone with iron sights and, you oh, know, shit. And, a, and a gun that's, yeah. you know, 100 years old. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the second shot that started ringing it. It's like, nice. really? Really? <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, talking about, like... Some things, you, yeah. you know, they do definitely do last. Uh, well, especially with old mill surplus of firearms, they did make them better back then because obviously they had, you know, more resources. They had countries aren't, you know, full blown militaries making them as opposed to like a now, not all, but a lot of firearms are manufactured by individual, you know, manufacturing companies, not whole government entities with those big juicy contracts. So, I mean, you look at the craftsmanship on some of those old Mausers. I mean, it's just beautiful. Then it eludes me at the moment, but. It's a really nice Swiss bolt action where it has a unique mm -hmm. mechanism where you just pull it straight back. Yep. I know um, Iraq yep. veteran 8888 just always raves about how perfect the manufacturing is. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing the craftsmanship that go into it. It really is a work of art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely, uh, you know, there's couple, there's quite a few of those companies. That, yeah, Miles are being one of them, obviously, and there's quite a few other companies, and you know, Nighthawk being one. Oh of yeah. Them. So we do have them in U.S. Uh, you know, thankfully we got we got some great firearms here. Well, yeah, and it's, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I compete with at least one Nighthawk. Uh, oh, nice. And um, they're a small company out of... Um, Arkansas? Arkansas. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've grown bigger over the years. It's just really funny. It's like, again, same type of thing in the industry, right? Like, you can buy a Glock for 600 bucks. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it will go bang, bang for much, all, most of the time. Yeah. Right? Um, you don't have to to take care of it that much, you know, versus you have a Nighthawk that is $6,000. Oh, yeah. So there's a little bit of a difference. Is that naked um, or with optic? Without the optic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, um, one of them is that, like, a lot of the Nighthawks, one of the, you know, they're absurdly accurate, you know, yeah. they, and most of the Nighthawks are actually more accurate than the, the shooter oh, yeah. uh, is capable of doing it. But they have, you know, great feel, like you, you just run it. It's like its own 
I can't you imagine know. how smooth that slide actually it's, is. It's amazing, right? And the trigger feel, everything is perfect. Uh, you know, you can at like seven, ten yards, I can just keep hitting the same hole over, you know, it's over and over without any support or like offhand. Yeah. Um, great tool. A competition, like you can run it really fast. You don't have to do anything. You can go a little walk into a competition versus, you know, let's say with a Glock, because was made for to be carried a lot by uh, by law enforcement and shot very little. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to be competitive with a stuck lock, it's not going to be very easy. You're going to spend a lot of money oh, yeah. doing a lot of stuff to it to be competitive against, you know. Upgrading literally every component to where we you get know, to point to some where, degree. Yeah. And then you <laughs> give up a lot of, uh, you know, reliability out of it because True. you just upgraded everything. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, the but you look at most, like, Ninehawks, they're just, like, they're functional art. They're oh, gorgeous. Yeah. They're just, you know, metal, the finish, the, you know, the fit and finish is just like, you know, the first time I looked at one and it was, um, and I was looking at it going like, this is an insane amount of money. I was like, oh, yeah. this is just, just, uh, yeah. And the first one I bought, actually, I, I bought it at a 20% discount. So it was, oh, nice. you know, there was that, oh, but yeah. it was, it was an impulse purchase. And then I went home and I'm like, oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> yeah. So I had to turn around and sell a bunch of other guns and yeah. stuff to be able to pay for it. Uh, but I mean, I made master with that gun. Oh, really? Um, nice. And like after thousands of rounds, you know, there's some weird on it, but it still looks super cool. And it still right. like works like it was brand, you know, like it was brand new. It's just even better than when it was brand new. It's like, um, well, the nice thing about guns, uh, it's, it's kind of similar to mechanical watches. For the most part, they're pretty darn durable. It's one of the few things we buy in our life, like modern society where you can expect to get decades of use and, you know, if properly maintained firearm, hundreds of years of use from that mm -hmm. same thing with, you know, appropriate maintenance, a little bit of oil cleaning every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the nice, it's kind of how I rationalize some of those purchases. It's like, they usually don't go down too much in value as long as you take care of it. And truth be told, it'll last a lifetime or right. several. Well, here's a fun one. So you have the, let's say five, $600 Glock that you had, right? Um, let's say it was Gen 2, Gen 3, whatever. Now you try to go sell it, you're gonna have difficulty selling it. Oh, yeah. And you're gonna sell it for a lot less than what you paid for, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I recently, uh, when I ended up acquiring another Nighthawk, I had to go sell a bunch of other guns. And one of them was a Nighthawk yeah. that I competed with yeah. in a 45. So You shot 45 to compete in? Um, for several years, I shot nothing but 45. Really? And it was, uh, I have the damage in my hand. I was going to say, that's a big caliber. That's a big it, one. Yeah, apparently it does damage your hand quite a bit uh, right. after, you know, 200,000 rounds or so. Oh my yeah. gosh, did he reload? Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't have afforded uh, to compete with a forty-five if I didn't reload. There's no way. Um, what kind of reloading equipment, or how do you get into that? Because I've, I've looked at Dylan Progressive presses. I know they're pretty popular, but we're you using precision single stage press, or no, what are we going Dillon into? Dylan six fifty. When I mean, at the amount of like a single match is at least hundred, like twenty. A major match is three hundred, four hundred rounds. Like, yeah, you have to have a progressive like Dylan. Yeah, I think I, I did most of it on the Dylan 650. Um, what kind of targets were you shooting at? Or were they stationary paper, or was it no, the are, course you run IDPA around? competitions or? like the course ones, right? Yeah. Like it's I'd be a targets uh, mostly or oh, awesome. steel, steel. So, but um, so I ended up selling that 45 Nine Hawk that I you know had for it was my like one of my back it was one of my backup guns actually, mm -hmm. um, but I sold it for about like four or five years after I bought it, mm -hmm. you know, with some wear on it. Or more than what I paid for it originally. Nice. There but you go. That many rounds of use. Yep. I still put, sold it for more than what I paid for. Yeah. Would have never happened in Glock. You know, it's again yep. the same thing. It's a different industry. Yep. The one that's hand well, and one of the things about Nighthawk, right? There, you know, uh, every gun is built by, by one gunsmith. Yeah. It's like it's art. It's like the Swiss watches, yep. right? And, and there's a few gun companies like I know there's Staccato in, te oh, yeah. you know, Georgetown, in Georgetown, Texas. Texas. They're yeah. they're another great company. Oh yeah. Um, my last major trophy in the World Championships, I got a master bomb shooting in Staccato. Oh nice. Great great gun company. What yeah, model? Oh uh, Staccato P. Oh really? Uh, in in carry optics. Um, really carry optics? Yeah. It was it's it was uh it was very competitive. It yeah. was uh I had um. I think I had 62 competitors at my level. Oh, wow. I had to compete against it, which was, uh, made it interesting. And, I've, I've yeah. shot the Staccato XC a couple times when my buddies has one with a Trishcon red dot on it. And it is, it's like the, he calls it, we call it the easy button. Cause like mm -hmm. at 100 yards, it just takes a shot and ding, he'll hit the steel. Like it's, yeah. 
almost like magical. It's so and, good. And it's funny because I was uh, I was back in Georgia for uh, I think it was last yeah last June for um, for Blade Show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the you know yearly big uh, knife industry show Blade Show is in Al- is in Atlanta Georgia every uh, every first weekend of June mm-hmm. so I was over there and then um, you know with my friends and uh, we were taking a break and I went to they have this huge gun shop mm-hmm. one of the largest gun shops in the U S uh, not too far from where the ex- exhibition center is so we walked in there just killing some time looking at stuff and. I was like, oh, wow, you guys don't have staccatos here, you know? And um, and they go, yeah, we've been trying to become a staccato dealer, but, you know, staccato's too busy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. They're, they won't, like, they won't give us a dealership because, like, they're selling everything they make. It's like Rolex. They got a wait list now. Like, there's so much demand for it. Right. Especially with, uh, <laughs> you know, John Wick coming out, helping them with those sales. A lot of people start to realize, oh, wait a minute, that uh, Terran Tactical is uh, tricked out uh, a little staccato XC, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's funny because it's like, again, you can walk into any gun shop and buy all the Glocks and, oh, yeah. you know, Springfields or whatever you want. Oh, yeah. But, like, the same gun shop, you know, uh, they if they are a stuck out dealer, dealer, they might have one, two, or three in stock, maybe. Maybe, if you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. So there's that, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, again, it's every industry is the same one. It's like the companies who make those products, like – uh still made by hand you know mostly uh but they're great products right and like absolutely uh i mean i'm a master level i'm master in like multiple divisions Mm. um i mean i can i and i wasn't firearms instructor i know how to test out guns i can probably i can push a gun to its limit yeah i've broken a lot of guns (laughs) um but you know like I can show you how much more accurate and much faster you know one gun versus the other one is you know and uh, you know it's it's and a hundred years later it's like one is going to be still that yep. functional art like the mauser you yep. know uh versus like uh, no offense to mr glock but oh, yeah that thing is ugly <laughs> uh, it's never won any beauty awards one of the most bizarre like why the hell did they do it moments was i remember ian on forgotten weapons did a review on factory engraved glocks which i they had a shot show like for display but well, that was the biggest head scratcher of why on earth is there a factory di- displayed uh, a factory engraved Glock? So the slide was all you know. They even had a gold inlay one for mm-hmm. the one guy in the world who might want it. I mean, it's kind of like a hand painted Toyota Corolla, like or, or gold paint. What Saddam's gold painted a uh, gold uh, gold plated AK. Oh yeah. <laughs> why? There's <laughs> yeah. There's there's some guns I can never get into. Like the gold plated thing. I'm like. Mm, I mean, yeah, the monetary no. value, like the gold is worth nothing. Or like the commemorative, the commemorative guns. Like every couple of years, they'll have the commemoration for the Zasva factory from Russia for the AK-47. And they'll want like, you know, seven to eight grand for it. It has gold plated parts and a fancy display case. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, that's not for me. Like I, I, to me, I just don't get it. It's right. Again, it, it, I, don't even, I would argue it's not even a work of art because I mean, I, I'm not going to name the store, but there's one store that has it on display for like years. I'm like, it's just an AK-47 with some extra paint on it and a nice little card that says commemoration to this year. It's not even signed by Mikael or anything like that. Right. It's like, eh, it's not. I'd rather get some more functional or like a competitive gun or something well, like that. Well, it's, it's funny. Like, I, I, like, yeah, I would never go buy a, you know, engraved AK, right? Yeah. Okay, they're, you know, they're functional tools. They yeah. were meant to be functional. There was nothing pretty about it. No. Um, Last year's world championship was in the C- CMP um, CMP range in uh, Talladega, Alabama. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know CMP. Just so the market 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 market. Market. Yeah. You used to be able to get good ML and grants for them back in the day. Well, they still have the shop yeah, in, in, at the range. So I was literally drooling ro- over some of their M1 grants. Yeah. And I was like, I was this close to buying one. And I'm going, <sighs> the thing is, like, I don't really... <sighs> Uh, I, I have guns that I carry and I have guns that I compete. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a lot of other, like outside of the one Mauser. Yeah, historical. Like, yeah. I, you yeah. know, I don't really have a lot of things that just sits in my safe that I got nothing to do, you know. Yeah. So I'm not that, you know, I don't collect guns for the sake of collecting guns. Um, and I was like, I was this close. I was still drooling over, you know. Yeah. What was the World War II gun? Yeah. The it, gun that it was this- won the World War II, supposedly oh, yeah. for you. I mean, still like, okay, it's functional. But it's so pretty. 
It is. It's beautiful wood, you know, beautiful metal. It's like, you know, like I said, again, you're Power. not going to say that for yeah. the AK. You're never going to say that for the Glock. No. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it, but somebody is, I mean, somebody's restoring them and selling them, yeah. you know, almost, well, well, 90 years after. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, some things are going to last. Uh, and, you know, if you want to go hunting, uh, that was a funny thing. Uh, my friend was the military historian when um, he was handing me that uh, Mauser. He was like, by the way, like you can take down any uh, hunting animal oh, yeah. in the U.S. Uh, with, with that thing. Oh, yeah. A 200 grain bullet that travels like, you know, whatever, 2,700 feet or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. Uh, you can't do that with a Glock, obviously, or you know, not recommended. You're probably <laughs> not going to try to do that with NAK. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, again, there are, you know, there are those things. It's like, yeah. I mean, the companies who make those products, oh, yeah. th- those products, right? They're going to last, and they're going to you're going to be able to sell them, um, and they're going to have the value. It's just, uh, I mean, yeah. historical collector firearms fascinate me, but just not at the point in my life where it makes sense. Like. I mean, for the historical nostalgia, I would love to have, like, an IBM-manufactured M1 carbine. Like, mm. it's not much any practical purpose, but just for the historical providence on the huge manufacturing and technological capabilities they had for better or worse during the war, it is kind of cool to see it stamped with IBM. And same with General Motors. They made all mm-hmm. the cool, you know, 1919s and that kind of, mm-hmm. you know, grease gun. And Siemens. But, oh, yeah, very true. I mean, people don't realize mm-hmm. all the industrial manufacturing around that category. But, yeah, like, it's, like would you ever want to get a machine gun in your lifetime? They're fun, but they're very expensive. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. good old supply and demand. Like for folks don't realize the United States, if your state allows it on a federal level, it has, and again, I'm not a lawyer by any means, but the way I understand it and the way that most people understand it is it has to be registered and manufactured with the government before 1986, which very limits the supply. You also have to pay a $200 tax stamp, a long paperwork process, although they allegedly will get, they're getting, I have rumors that are getting faster at it. And, but because of the very, very, mm-hmm big supply constriction mm. that means an ar-15 that usually is a thousand dollars for commercial ar-15 for a semi-auto if you own a transferable which is what they call the legal mm. legal the anyone can buy a machine gun yeah. it's like 30 grand plus for an yeah. ar-15 so i know yeah. some people treat them as an investment like on gunbroker to this day it's been on there for years now i just look at it just for the novelty like what are they asking for they have a colt manufactured never fired full auto ar-15 transferable so anyone can buy it 135 or 145 thousand dollars yeah no i was that's not my that's i mean no. even if yeah that's that's not my thing no. uh, definitely not um i think the cheapest one is still the mac 10 like i mean i say cheap for the category is cheap for people it's not i think the cheapest machine gun you can get that's transferable is around nine to twelve thousand dollars these days before it before you have to pay for the ammo to feed it too right right <laughs> yeah i mean for me, like again for me i don't have things that sit in my safe yeah uh, and I don't, I don't really see myself investing, quote unquote, investing in those things. Yeah. Um, now, having said that, let's say if I was visiting Japan and I come across a, you know, or whatever, come across a, you know, like ninety eight. Well, now I was thinking about a katana. Oh, for example, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, a few hundred years old, beautiful katana. Yep. It's like, yeah, that might be something. I would be very tempted. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. something you can actually kind of. Just- display yeah. and then another one of those like that katana was kind of like the you know kind of like the um machine gun of the of, Japan. Of, the, of the time but it was yeah. again even when it was created it was treated more like a ferrari right to some yeah. degree well, so ha- hand hammered hand forged handmade very ceremonial i mean there's a huge tradition and i'd love to get like a vintage real one would be a beautiful piece of history yeah. too as well as a display piece right yeah again 400 500 year you know whatever product yeah i would love to have one uh i wouldn't probably care that much for the machine gun yeah wouldn't consider buying one as an investment but katana or maybe yeah that'd be pretty cool yeah i mean i've studied the mar- uh, japanese martial arts i know how to handle a you know a, a katana actually oh really uh, i've done yeah i do so oh, very cool um yeah it, it makes it really interesting to watch the samurai movies because you know 
who are the extras and who actually was trained to handle one. Oh yeah. Well, that's one of the disappointing things once you become a product or an enthusiast in most hobbies, like you watch a movie with any gun, you're like, well, that's rubber. Wait a minute. They haven't reloaded in 20 minutes or whatever it is. It's like, or how are they cocking a, uh, why is there a cocking noise, uh, noise from a Glock? Yes. Or, like every time they focus in a gun or everyone draws a gun, like, wait a minute, they just took a gun out of a holster, but it makes a cocking noise. Like mm. it, it's cause it's Hollywood and it sounds cool. But again, like, no, if it's a Glock, you're not going to hear a revolver, you know, the follower is not mm. going to spin. You're not going to hear click a click of like a Colt. It's like, no, it's just, if anything, if you hear anything at all, it's going to be the sound of it coming out. And maybe if they, if they don't carry one at the chamber, they will rack it. Then you'll hear the racking sound. But it's like, and why are there people, why are people constantly racking guns in on movies? Oh, like, it's why would you carry yeah. a gun? <laughs> it's like, if you're a professional a police oh, officer yeah. or whatever, why would you carry a gun without it around in the chamber? Oh, Oh, hundred ten percent dramatic know. effect. Was, and, and being a farms instructor before, it's like mm -hmm. you don't understand. It's like the more you mess around with a gun, the more likely that you're having a uh, you know accidental discharge. Yeah. It's like every exactly. time you're uh, okay. Every time you like, manipulate it, so no point of error possibly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's especially if this, you know, obviously you gotta take it out and clean it, and yeah. you know, there's bullets at back and all that stuff. You know, I'll, on my carry gun, I'll usually take it out and whatever the round in the chamber, I'll shoot it mm -hmm. uh, every X number of, you know, range visits or whatever, but, and then we'll get clean, et cetera. But um, yeah, the, I don't go around like loading and unro unloading my carry gun, you know, five times a day. Yeah. yeah. That's a good way to make sure that that round that you keep chambering goes from this long to this long and the yeah. pressures go up, you know. Exactly. So. I think the only movie that's gotten it any at all close is probably the John Wick films where Keanu Reeves is doing, uh, they do yeah. in comparison, in comparison <laughs> to like the average Hollywood film, like they get moderately clo close, which for the industry is saying something like, what was it? I remember the blacklist on Netflix years ago, they're running around with the SIG MPX and like half the time, like, wait a minute, there's no iron sights or red dot on that. So they're just pointing and hoping like, I remember Fast and Furious, a couple of those movies, they had the P90 and a couple of other guns were like, oh yeah, no sights at all. Just point Some or no, i guess the p90 is built in what was it the other one no there's a the, couple the, the optic on the p90 is not yeah uh, they had the red fire og oh yeah. yeah yeah it was a couple yeah. of those yeah. that was kind of disappointing i rented for one of the cybersecurity uh, events that we hosted last was it last year, year before we rented a styre og and like within maybe 10 or 15 minutes it was already down i was like come really? on styre that's like, surprising huh? yeah i was like come on really uh that's very surprising uh i have a yeah one of my really good friends he does collect tires. Oh, really? And actually, the same time when we were playing with that Mauser, he brought out one of his star Ogs that was never shot. It was like really? still factory, sighted in, been sitting in his safe. You know, the, had the one X uh, optic on it. Yeah, that iconic and, one. And, and we're like, come on, dude. It's, it's like, this is not a collector. You know, you got let's shoot it. Yeah. And with the one X dot on it. Um, so I was like, all right, fine. So he loads up. That same gong at 300 yards, first shot and every shot. Really? Dude, that's impressive. Factory zero it. We're like, okay. That's pretty and, good. You know, and, and we're like, then I got on it, same thing, first shot, every shot. It was like, bing, 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 bing. It was no problem to hit good. a six inch gong at 300 yards with un un unmagnified optic. I mean, it's got to be one of three successful bullpup designs ever made. Like, you got the FMP90, you got the Steyr AUG, and then. Yeah, that's true. The IW that one's pretty. I, uh, to me, I really didn't shoot like that machine gun. We rented it for another cybersecurity cybersecurity event, and just the trigger. To me, I don't like the thing where you have to pull the trigger and then it goes single shot. And then you keep pulling the trigger. There's no safety selector to get to the machine gun part. I don't know, to me, that always is a little bit awkward. But in terms, of, if you want a compact design, that is a brilliant one over at Tavor. The Tavor. I mean, it's incredible. I competed with one. Oh really? How do you like it's it? It's a model, anyway. You, um, you upgrade the uh, trigger with the Geisley drop in, or nope. do you, or really just factory straight up? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I was looking at it going like, I don't compete with it enough to justify putting that much money more into the trigger, mm -hmm. and um, it, w it was interesting. So one thing I like about them is how reliable they are. You know, oh, yeah? they are piston driven. You know, yep. um, you know, all my like three gun ARs, I have to I have to clean them pretty regularly. You know, yep. versus I tell her, like, I'll just spray some oil on it and really <laughs> go. Yeah. And you know, it will run. It will run. Mm. Um, and then, but it's, it's fun to compete with like different guns because uh, one thing, like, especially with some of these, I was shooting it in a three gun match. Oh yeah. Uh, or maybe it was a two gun match, but it was kind of interesting because things that you don't, 
the cool thing about these competition shooting competition is like guns that never fail or things that never happen in a in a like square range yeah controlled environment where you're static and standing right? still yep. yeah stuff will go wrong if it can go wrong it will go wrong in competition shooting yeah right um i have broken fixed rear sights off of a cz before really something like i never thought it was possible i mean it literally broke in the half i, I mean, mean those are heavy duty to begin with i never seen yeah. that and it's a really? cast part it's like how in the hell did that happen it's like it happens apparently so yeah. you well, know um literally if it's gonna break if it, you know you can break it in competition and it was kind of funny. Uh, I was shooting the Tabor uh, in a uh, in a two gun match, and you know you're. It's really cool because it's so compact. You know you're le- leaning around the wall. You're shooting. Okay, it's kind of cool. Um, I go to the other side of the wall. I'm leaning the other side. Okay, I was like, oh, well, I gotta I gotta shift the gun to my left, you know, shoulder now, uh, and I'm kind of shooting like this, and it was kind of funny because the ejection port is now right here. Yeah, <laughs> and then what happened actually was the round bounced off uh, the the the, uh, the uh, cartridge that spin cartridge bounced out, hit the wall, and actually got stuck back in the chamber and caused a, a failure. Really? I'm looking at it going. It's like the unlucky lottery. Really? But like I said, anything that will go around, oh and, and it was very interesting. Like literally, like being around the corner on the left, and you're seeing all this, you know you're this close to the chamber and you know yeah. and seeing it. it was it was interesting oh that's why it's kind of like nice to be able to what i like to do is if i'm going to carry something or if we're going to like it's going to be my nuts the nice stand gun or whatever i'll take it out and shoot it in competition make yeah. sure that it will it will work like it's supposed to under stress what's the most surprising thing you've seen in competition in terms of maybe something breaking or something that was even more reliable than you originally thought um well, there's a couple of things. So we talked about the uh, rear sight breaking. That was one of them. Um, the uh, I obviously uh, I've seen Sig 320s go off in their holster. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was interesting. Um, I've seen as much as people rag on 1911s in competition. Um, there are many, many, many competitions where. When I was competing with a 1911, that my gun did not have a single malfunction. Yeah. But people in my squad shooting Glocks had multiple malfunctions. So. Really? I wonder if because they just, because again, once you start manipulating the original design, that's usually when you start introducing failure points. I'm wondering how much they customize those Glocks and kind of decrease the reliability subsequently. Right. Again, if you have to be and do all that to be competitive with another platform, you inherently making a very reliable platform not so reliable so mm-hmm. but yeah uh, i mean because a lot of people will do all those things to be able to make the trigger much better you know all that so yeah um but those were some of the interesting ones um well so i uh the the and the other thing is like pccs are very interesting oh yeah um they get more and more popular too they are because they're, you know, they're so low recoil, oh, yeah. they're so easy to, but. Plus nine millimeter. I mean, it's just, the amount of applications yeah. is pretty yeah. large for that. Yeah. Uh, and when we were talking about PCCs, pistol caliber carbines, yeah. you Usually, know. More often than not, nine millimeter. Right. Maybe sometime someone will have a 10 millimeter or 45, maybe. Yeah, I have, I have one in 45. Also. Oh, really? Yeah. I, you know, I've, uh, but it was really interesting. Um, so, again, the, the PCCs that are made strictly for competition, mm-hmm. I've seen them, like, you, you know, you'll have the PCC guys run around because they don't have to reload. They have 30-round magazines, you know. Yep. Uh, and then sticks. They, they can run super splits because they have a comp and they have lightened, you know, um, bolt carriers and all this stuff, right? Like super light triggers and uh, and they're doing, like, you know, super quick splits and still hitting the zero. So it's all nice because they have three-point in contact, Heavy gun, no recall, also great. Uh, until it's not. Yeah. They break in competition a lot. Really? Uh, you would be surprised. I mean, the and it's funny because a lot of platforms that are like the stock or military version of the same thing will hardly ever break for with shooting it that much. But yeah. the competition world is pushing it so much mm-hmm. to be that competition level. Yeah. 
you know, you start making a very reliable platform, not so reliable. Um, I was the match director for Texas State multiple years, and one of them, uh, we have an equipment check area, Mm -hmm. right? So we have the chrono, make sure that the ammo uh, meets requirements, and then we have a gun submit literally sitting there making sure that the gun uh, is safe to shoot and it doesn't have any modifications that are against the rules. Um, and I was, you know, I, I never forget, uh, I was visiting one time, uh, you know, just checking to see how it's going and the, and the equipment check. And I literally turned my back to, you know, walk back to my ATV and I heard, you know, and they're doing, they're about to the Corona one of the PCCs and I go, Burr! Oh, I turn around <laughs> and go, what just happened? Like, yes, that one for it's like obviously Falota is not allowed in competition. Right. And that yeah. was not a Falota gun. That was the trig- a, the trigger is like a pound trigger, some crazy like that, I'm guessing. Well, you know, the problem was yeah, they were it, it literally because it was designed to be like such a light competition trigger, yeah. It failed. Yeah. It literally failed. And it <laughs> happened, you know, and somebody said, Well, it might have happened once earlier in the day in, in a stage. I was like, Okay, that's bad that I didn't hear about it, but mm-hmm. yeah, it literally in the equipment check had failed so you know the person was getting dq'd over it oh man uh, and, you know and i think i think they didn't have a backup today i mean that's one of the things when you shoot competitions you learn that because they're mechanical devices they're tools yeah. they're gonna fail so you always bring it back up as close to possible as the you know as the as your main one and are there any competitions where you could su- shoot suppressors or are those not allowed because they'd probably make it a little bit easier i'm guessing because you're, dra- you're dramatically going to re- um, decrease that recoil. Right. I'm trying to remember if IDP or USPC can use for suppressors. Suppressors are a big problem because, you know, we use shot timers. Uh, and they can't hear them. And yeah. it makes it very difficult for the shot timers to pick up the shot. So uh, I, don't, I don't think they're allowed mostly. Um, it's, I mean, for pistols, obviously, they're not going to work because they're not going to fit the box and all that. Oh, yeah. So, I, I mean, for PCCs, they might be an option but i don't if i remember correctly we don't allow them um yeah and it's you know kind of funny because like uh again suppressors comps well, like you i think idpa started allowing comps in some of the divisions last year i think mm-hmm. um you know so everybody's going to stuck out xc's and stuff oh yeah but uh, people don't you know some people don't realize it's like well, guess what? You know, some of the competition that we used to use won't run on it. And then, by the way, there's another part that gets very dirty. And if you're not maintaining oh, yeah. it, I heard of one competitor who won one sanction match and completely lost the other one because the comp failed. Really? So, again, you know, it, it's like yeah. all the features. Introducing right? more val- variables, more failure points. Right, right. And that's so, um, like, with my with my uh, running 1911s in competition, right? Um, And, and, you know, at the master level with your gear, like you change as little as possible, Mm. uh, especially during the season. I mean, you can try to optimize your equipment, you know, off season, and then you got to, you know, make sure that it will last, right? Um, But with 1911, right, again, um, replace a couple of, you know, replace two, two, and three springs, oil it, clean it, and if it's a build, well built one, it will, you know, it will run. Well, John Moses Browning is pretty darn, he's a, probably the pinnacle genius in firearm history. Like, you think of all the all the things he's invented, invented over 100 years ago, still used today. Yeah. It's quite astronomical. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like uh, one of my competition 1911s of about 65,000 rounds through. 65,000. Oh, right. my gosh. Another has over 50. Uh, have you ever have 20. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever outshot a barrel or? A yes. Bet? I've, well, I don't know about outshotting, but and the right, one I mean, that has the like, 65,000, I cracked the barrel. It was a oh cart barrel. Yeah. And the, the manufacturer was so surprised <laughs> yeah. that even though technically as a custom gun, it was not on their warranty, um, they wanted that barrel. Oh, I'm sure. They wanted to know why in the heck. This was, I think it happened around 30 something. 30,000 round count? Maybe 30,000. I can't remember. Um, so they wanted that barrel to study, and right? Yeah. So they were like, "We'll give you a new barrel. Just send yeah. it us, please, because we want to know how in the heck it's possible for, that you cracked it." They're like, "You had a squib, yeah? I had a squib seventeen thousand rounds ago. No, 
Like, still and it still worth for twenty th- or yeah about you know it's another fifteen thousand or whatever the math is on that. Yeah, it was like well I had oh to squip, but then I you know they were thinking that it, it cracked because it is quit. and we're like yeah. no this cracked because of somehow somehow it was because of where. And for, I was gonna say for the folks who aren't big into guns, a squib is when the bullet the bullet goes out, but the bullet doesn't actually exit the barrel. So right. it gets lodged in the barrel. Yeah, it usually happens because especially if you're reloading your own ammo. Mm-hmm. Somehow in the process, something gets screwed up and you either have no powder or li- little powder in the, in the cartridge, yep. which means when the primer goes off, you have a little bit of explosion. It sounds like a poof instead of a bang. Yep. And then the bullet doesn't leave. And hopefully you're not shooting really fast at the, when it happens, because if you try to shoot the next round, obviously you're going to r- blow out your, your gun. It's yep. gonna, um, in my case, it was stuck so like... It was stuck very much in the barrel that I couldn't uh, chamber the next round, which is what kept me from blowing out my gun. That's pretty lucky. Yeah, so, that's, yeah. That's, what, yeah. that's what you want because, yeah. 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 yeah, and then, of course, but, you know, that actually, that happening cost me that entire match because, oh, shit, really? you know, I, I had to stop in the middle of the stage, at, close to the end of the stage. I, I got penalties for not being able to engage the last two targets and all the points down for those. Yeah, so I got, like, an additional something like 20 some seconds added to my stage time, which Ouch. completely destroyed my chances at getting a trophy at that match. Uh, and then of course, you know, you take your gun to the safe area and then you have to like basically use a square butt to get the, the round out. So, um, but again, so yes, I did break on, on that gun. I brought the barrel and I brought, um, the guide rod shattered, uh, oh, brought slight stops. I mean, oh you gosh. know, um, the bushing on the barrel cracked. Uh, yeah, they, they, you know, in those 65,000 rounds, especially 45, That's even, a, even yeah. though it's not a very high pressure round, it's, it's, still, it's still, I mean, try cleaning a 45 after shooting 100 rounds versus a, a nine. Oh, you'll yeah. realize that it's a lot more involved. It, it takes, yeah, you know, three times as long because there's just so much carbon and you know. Oh yeah, it's a bigger, heavier bullet. A lot more, a lot more powder in there. I mean, it makes sense. A lot more interior. So is that the gun that was that the Nighthawk or what? What manufa- if you don't mind me asking, what manufacturer was that? Uh, that was a <laughs> that was com- combat. Uh, Wilson Combat. No, actually, this is a um, like one gunsmith company out of Georgia. You know, uh, combat. Um, Precision Technologies, uh, and that was the. It was my 45th birthday present to myself. Was it 40? No, 40th birthday present to myself. Uh, Project Bora Bora. Complete, oh, yeah? complete custom. I had to sit down and wait for almost nine months for that gun to be built. Oh, wow. And I got to specify every single, like to the millimeter, everything about that gun. Really? It was it was fun. And what was it was, that, what's that build process like? Do you kind of sit down with pen and paper? Do you kind of get on a call together? Or? So it was interesting because you talk, I mean, it's the one gun one guy one you know is running the entire thing he's gone to a lot more uh automation stuff nowadays but he's still um you know one or two guys working there um so it was actually one of those things it's like uh he he had, he had a pistol that he built for for somebody else and i saw that and i was like oh my god that looks just gorgeous it's like yeah. that would be that is one of those functional arts and it was like and um i basically called him up and i said I like everything about that gun, so I want it kind of like that gun, but here's the different things that I want changed. Um, and, and then I thought that was going to be it. Uh, but then, he, you know, he's like, okay, so he'll get the order form ready. He says, okay, you know, basic things like 5-inch, 45, 9-11, you know, you know, uh, magwell, this magwell, and, the, the, you know, this and this and this. So that's great. And then he sends it to you, then, you know, you pay for it and then you're going to start waiting but mm. when in periodically he would get back to me and go okay he'd be like okay you want a trigger that's like this or like this or you want you know you want absurdly accurate or you want reliable or you want like you want something between yeah and then like one day it was fun, kind of funny because he calls me up and go oh so how how deep and wide is the rear notch and how wide is the front uh sight to the millimeter i'm like huh <laughs> well to the point you know whatever millimeter i'm like really he's like yeah you gotta tell me exactly how wide you want the front sight mm. and tall yeah and how wide you know the rear notches and you know how deep it is I was like 
I never even thought about it. It was yeah. like something that just happens and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Besides, so I literally had to go grab a bunch of guns I had in the, in, you know, in the house and the, the ones I competed with or whatever. I had to go to the, like take out my calipers yeah. and measure everyone and then went to the range and like test a bunch of stuff mm. and basically send them something that, oh, I think this is it, you know, and yeah, it was, it was literally, you have to like tell them anything like, what color is the fiber on the front side? Assuming that you want a fiber optic front, you know, right. it's like all of those things. It do, was. Do you want a fiber optic front for um, for com- competitive shooting, or I guess even my carry ones have fiber oh, optic really? front. Yeah, yeah. Um, and black rear. Every gun, every one I have, pretty much every gun I have is fiber optic front and uh, black rear. Oh really? Do you like that more than traditional? Like, because I know a lot of my friends will have the two rear be red or different color than the front. Um, I've done a lot of training having, if you have three dream dots, uh, having the front and the back different are a good idea because otherwise in the dark, you actually can't tell which one is your front dot versus uh, rear. Um, but that's another thing I found out when shooting in the dark and training is that if you can't see your sights, what are you shooting at? True. Do you really want to be shooting bullets at something, someone that you can't identify? So that's why my carry gun doesn't have tritium sights on it, but it has it does have a flashlight on it really? on the rail because yeah. makes it, sense. Yeah, uh, because yeah, I want to be able to positively identify, and once I can flashlight it, all I need is that you know fiber in the front still, mm-hmm. and the you know black rear ones, and I can exactly put it where I want. Um, it was the same exact setup in my world competition, uh, world championship, you know, gun that I won the trophy with, and it was amazing because. Lights on competition is new ish. Yeah. Originally, a lot of people were like, oh, just so it's a weight, you know. And I'm like, no, what I do is I like to have my competition set up similar to my carry setup. Makes sense. Um, and then in the World Championship last fall, um, there was a stage where you started outside. There are one, two, three, four, five. There are five targets. I think five targets, four targets outside. And then there, the rest of the targets were in a darkened room really? that, that had a prop like Jeep uh, silhouette cut out with the headlights actually pointing at you and with LEDs. Really? And it was completely dark. And there were a bunch of threat and non-threat targets in, inside this dark room. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a few factors here. You're starting in the in bright outside mm-hmm. and then you're suddenly adjusting to a completely dark area and you still got to be able to shoot you're on the clock right mm-hmm. um a lot of competitors were kind of upset about it because of well if i knew i would have brought a flashlight or you know whatever uh, and um and i was kind of psyched about that stage because i'm like i have a f- light on my gun yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna rock the stage Definitely. uh and a lot of you know um high level competitors didn't do so well on that and it was, uh, it was, for me, it was one of my best stages of the match. Really? And because I, well, part of it, because I had confidence in my setup. Yep. Um, the other, you know, and then it, and it proved that it worked well because I ran that stage one of the faster times and completely zero down, no penalties whatsoever. And nice. Yeah. It was, for me, it was pretty cool because I, uh, so you're shooting from the door into the room, mm-hmm. lights pointing at you so and there's like threats and non-threats are like this so you have to identify which one was which yeah so um obviously you know with my with my thumb on the light you know i had the light i could see everything really well and just went Boop, and you know unload show clear you know safe my uh gun and kind of walk i turned i was gonna walk away and then the, you know the safety officer i was being an ass a little bit probably but Safety officer was like, oh, you don't want to know what your score is? Like, I already know. I, I shot that one zero down. <laughs> I can tell you wherever a bullet is. It's just because yeah. I could see it so well. And he's like, well, a lot of people were, like, getting the threat and the non-threat confused and missing shots and because they were fumbling around with another flashlight, you know. Yeah. Uh, I had We had one guy in our uh, from our club. He took out the flashlight and goes, Let's turn it on, and he had it. And he was fumbling on it, and he grabs it. And he goes, and he actually had it pointing at himself. So he <laughs> no. blinded himself with his flashlight, and then he had to sit there. Oh, God. you know, it was. <laughs> so yeah, it's 
that's one of the reasons I like IDPA because you can get the like you can you know you can compete with your carry gear yeah. and, and so and, and then you can try it out and obviously it is competition it's a game yeah. it's, it's not real life training but it, under pressure you get to you know learn things and then you get to you know work the kinks out of equipment that you may end up carrying um actually my carry gun is a staccato Oh, really? That I competed with for a year. The uh, so, Staccato P? Uh, or older C. Oh, yeah. Single set, actually. Really? I, that's going to be one of my other questions. How many people are rocking? I'm guessing is the most popular configuration right now for competitive shooting double stack 9mm 2011s? That has been, yes. I think that is probably the, one of the most common ones that you see yeah. nowadays. Yeah. They're, and especially because you see how many new companies come out. Oh, yeah. Everybody is making those nowadays. I mean, Springfield got into it. Oh, um, yeah, that's true. You know. Is it the Protégé? Yeah, Protégé. Yeah. Prodigy. I mean, pro yeah. yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. That's the brand then, I know the least about, you know, I think. And there's, every other day, there's another one that I hear. Uh, there's yeah. one that now takes Glock mags. There's another one what? that takes, yeah, it's just, yeah. It's just, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even keep track of them, but it's been, yeah, it's, but they're very common because obviously they're, you know, uh, great triggers and oh, great yeah. platform. I mean, um, I think the Scott XC has like a two and a half pound trigger pull. It's something ridiculously light and nice and crisp. Personally, I don't like anything on, uh, under three. Oh, really? What do you tune your guns into? Or what's your... Three and a half. Three and a half? All right. Yeah. Um, I started out with double action, single action Berettas and SIGs. Uh, I, I like hammer gun fire guns because I can subconsciously tell where the hammer is when oh, yeah. I'm, uh, my, my finger is on the trigger. I'm, I'm the same way. And because I keep my finger on the trigger, you know, most of the time, mm. uh, I don't like anything too light because then you, you can end up having an accidental discharge, which yeah. obviously that's a no-no. So, and are, you, are you rocking the Streamlight or Surefire? What kind of light do you prefer? Uh, Streamlight. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. They make some good stuff. I've never had any issues with them. Um. So it's that. funny because um, well, Streamlights, like uh, my ones that I had in training and, you know, um, before I never had any issues, but uh, my competition one, that was the cool thing about running one in competition. I broke the a gate, uh, the battery gate. Really? So like when I was at the world championships, I literally had spare, uh, spare battery compartment uh, door yeah. uh, in my, you know, uh, in my uh, in my bag with me, just because I know that it's possible. I mean, it's a plastic part. True. Uh, you know, you run it enough, it's gonna break. So. Yep. But yeah, outside of that, I mean, I have it on my carry gun, competition gun. You know, so yeah, they they make good stuff. So, so I mean, Surefire does too. So. Oh yeah, well they're also. I was gonna say that's another big price point too. It's like they know. Well, they, it's also because it's made in the USA, where a lot of other uh, competing flashlights are not. Well, right. also, also partially because the military contracts kind of mandated it has to be. But right. yeah, it's also a little bit. Yeah, you pay for that little premium, just like their suppressors and everything else they make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're um, yeah, they're another one of those great American companies. Yeah. Uh, do, we do. We always talk about it like, oh, everything is made in China. I was like, no, not really. There's plenty, still yeah. plenty of good manufacturing in the U.S. Um, That's also partially just kind of by law, though. You look at, yeah. you look at yeah. ITAR and the international compliance with right. firearms. Like, there's a re like, even if it's a foreign company, like right. AKA like Beretta, the reason the 1992F was iconically made in the U.S.A. is because they won the U.S. Army contract. Was it night after they moved away right. from 1911? Because that's Makes it well, not just that's shipping why logistics, they have to but have the plant in Maryland. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we have a couple, you know, great fire, international firearms companies headquartered in the U.S. because it's you know made here. Which is funny because if you, I don't know if you're a libertarian or not. Oh yeah, I got a lot it. of people Definitely. are right. Uh, well, most at my, least in Texas, most of my tendencies, you know. yeah. Um, Less is better. <laughs> so, well, that's interesting because keep in mind that like if we if you were completely in a libertarian society, mm -hmm. a lot of those businesses wouldn't exist because government is not going to force you. To make things in the U.S. That would be against right, the, the principles because oh, yeah. you're going to go, oh, we're going to get the cheapest from wherever, you know, yeah. whoever. Uh, open market, completely open market. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not everything is so black and white. Well, I think it would be, again, well, like a lot of other products that, well, of the few products that aren't mandated for being made in the USA, it's usually you're, you have to spend more. And usually the way they market it and they build it is manufacturers because high premium quality. It's very difficult to compete. Well, I mean, on what about New price. Balance? They own the only reason uh, yeah. you know New Balance has a factory in U.S. still is because of the military contract. I have my I'm on my uh, 16th or 17th pair, uh, pair of dad shoes, the uh, New Balance 990 series. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, the, yeah. It's because not the I forget the specific contract that they won, but yeah, every military branch uses them. They just change out the insignia on the tongue of the shoe. But yeah, it's what here if, because it's but made if it wasn't for Barry Amendment, that's what you that's would what not is. have yeah. a New Balance factory. You would all, not have a sports shoe factory in the U.S. Although fun debate, I'd love to dive in if you got extra time. But what if I mean, if it was truly a global libertarian society? The cost of manufacturing in the United States would go down because there would be less rules, laws, and stipulation regulations. I highly doubt it. You know, but if there's no government, like in theory, that would drive the cost down. Now, I think as a society, we still come together and we want certain things, but that would be a fact. It wouldn't be the singularity factor. I think on average, it'd still be more expensive. But I mean, one of the reasons so, it, one of the reasons it's so hard to make stuff in the USA is because the compliances, like from you know, manufacturing, the EPA. I mean, there's so a lot of hoops I'll, to jump I'll tell through. you one thing. So um, I read the whole original uh, World is Flat book, mm -hmm. right? Um, Thomas Friedman, I think, right, uh, is the author, I believe. Um, obviously, I'm not saying that he's basically arguing that, you know, a completely borderless, you know, world, the products are going to go made, you know, wherever they're the cheapest, et cetera, right? So it was kind of funny because I was reading that. Yeah. At the same time, uh, I was running an outsourcing operation uh, as part in, in Accenture, one of yeah. the largest technology companies in the world. Oh yeah. Um, and one of the contracts, and I've actually seen this uh, mm -hmm. since then. Um, one of the contracts, I was very uh, one of the accounts. I was, you know, we were supporting a major global bank, mm -hmm. um, and we had the operation where. Uh, we had 25% of the staff in Atlanta and 75% of the staff in uh, Philippines. Yeah. And for the contract to be profitable for Accenture, 75% mm -hmm. of, of the work had to be done in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And 25, you know, because obviously huge hourly rate difference. Oh, yeah. Between, you know, talk about, uh, you know, very highly technical experience resources, right? Mm -hmm. um, in reality, as much as we tried, uh, as much as we try to train the Philippines or resources, et cetera, in reality, 75% of the work got done by the 25% in Atlanta. And, really? And I have a similar thing that happens nowadays, or I've seen this happen quite a bit with, um, in, even in data engineering, we, because, you know, uh, let's say, you have companies who have data engineers. I, I've worked with companies, uh, multiple companies. I've seen this happen over and over. Data engineers in U.S., data engineers in some of the Western European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, salaries are significantly higher than data engineers, in, for example, in India. Mm -hmm. um, but do you, do you, let's say, and I've seen this recently, uh, my Indian data engineer, let's say, is making, you know, one-fifth of the Western European one, right? Mm -hmm. or, or U.S. one. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that for it to break even, they would have to be able to do so, if, but let's say if my productivity in Western Europe and US, if they're doing 10 times more in an hour mm. than in India, yeah. how am I saving money? I'm not. True. Right? It's actually costing me more to do in India than it is in Western Europe or, or on shore. Yeah. And I see this over and over and over and over. I mean, why? Like one of the major reasons in IT where I've seen more CIOs lose their jobs over outsourcing. Really? If it's so great, mm -hmm. then why are they all losing their jobs? Because they, they go to the CFO and say, or the CFO comes in and goes, oh, we got to do outsourcing because it's going to save us so much money because per hour it's so much cheaper yeah. to hire these people in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, guess what? It's an ideal world. Everything being equal. Everything is not being equal, yep. especially in IT. Uh, even though, like, Clouds change some things, right? Like they have access to the systems without having a big lag. That was in the early days, right? Like yeah. if you had a lot of on-prem systems in US mm -hmm. uh, and then you had a lot of, you know, data engineers, programmers in India, mm -hmm. you, ha they had to, you had to deal with lag, et cetera, you know? So it was a little bit anti-productivity, uh, Productiv Pro yeah. right? But mm -hmm. the thing is still, like if I am, if I, you know, there's obviously cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I have to, you know, for me to, to create specs for something to be built in India, mm. I have to, because I'm not there, Yeah, 
I have to basically put into spec very high detail, mm -hmm. right? And then I got to get on a you know call with India and explain to them in very high detail, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and certain things that I didn't think about putting on paper. Yeah. Um, and then you know I hand it off, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then they go off and. Sometimes they built, you know, a lot of things. Sometimes what happens is that they hit something that that was not accounted for in that paper in that mm -hmm. spec, and they go, "Okay, does he want me to do this or this?" Mm -hmm. It's like, do I want to really take a chance and get and taking a guess? Uh, I'm gonna send them an email. Yeah. Well, I'm sleeping. The yep. earliest I'm gonna come back to them is another like seven hours and whatever later. Yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, nothing is getting worked on that. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, he has a lot of other things that he can go work on and can switch whatever. Mm -hmm. But okay, so you know, uh I see the thing, you know, I see the email in the morning, let's say I take care of it or I send it and it in a response. Well, guess what? He's sleeping. Yeah. He's not going to do anything on it for empty hours. Mm -hmm. And if I'm smart, I'll, you know, I'll send the email and then actually schedule something to talk to him because he might have further questions because of the email I just sent. Mm -hmm. If I didn't do that, he might look at it and go, well, okay, well, this doesn't completely answer or I'm not too clear. He might send another email back. Mm -hmm. Or let's say he keeps going and maybe he hits the next thing. Yeah. And we have the cycle happening again. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not saying they're not as good as, let's say, on site resources, et cetera, because a lot of times they don't have as much experience either, right? Um, because, you know, you can't outsource 300,000 jobs in the US to, you know, 300,000 experienced uh, resources in India, right? Obviously, it's, it uh, doesn't yet. just work that. <laughs> but, right? So I'm not saying, you know, there are plenty of, obviously, it's a, you know, country with a billion people. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of smart people there. Right. Oh, yeah. right? Um, it has to be the number one country yeah. for tech outsourcing too. Like right. all the largest providers are all headquartered exactly. there. Exactly. Uh, but the problem is like, okay, so, uh, you know, their culture, they're, you know, they're not, uh, they don't, they're not used to taking initiative or thinking themselves as much as let's say Americans do, because we're very independent thinkers uh, mostly or well, used to be. I don't know about that. <laughs> anyway. yeah. So, but anyway, there's some culture issues, even without the culture issues, if everything was, uh, you know, equal. Okay. So we have that whole process, communication process, um, you know, umpteen hours. The time, the time delay. You know, yeah, time delays and all that stuff. So they go build the stuff. Uh, they come back, you know, it goes back and forth, back and forth. So compared to that, like, uh, I have data engineers in Europe. I have data engineers in India. I have data engineers in U.S. Mm -hmm. Some things... I can get it done in a matter of a few hours here mm -hmm. with my data engineer because he's sitting across the, you know, the cubicle, cubicle from, yeah. well for me, you know, and I go, nope, do this, do this, or, you know, we're like looking at it. We're doing very agile, you know, programming. We put something in front of the user mm -hmm. that's literally in the same building yep. or in the same country, same lifetime, and they give us feedback and they go, no, 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 I want it this way, this way, this way. We literally immediately, it's done, went back. Okay, great. So, for us, like, you know, we'll have some kind of request that comes in and go like, oh, we forgot about this. We're about to roll out this functionality or campaign or we need this. Like, we need this done, like, in the next two days. Oh, geez. Right? So we're literally, okay, great. We have people here. We, you know, we're working on it. We can show, you know, again, we're working agile. Uh, we can show prototypes. We can, you know, show progress. And, and we can literally walk, you know get on a call and, you know, a little walk them through QA and then they finish QA after we get off and, you know, okay, great. We'll go live tomorrow. Um, versus we try the same thing, you know, with offshore outsourcing. Yeah. And there's the first thing they're going to tell you, it's going to take them two days to give you a, you know, estimate half the time. Do you think we'll see a major business trend of the pendulum moving back to more insourcing and building out internal IT staff? Because it, it seems like every couple of years, again, you have new leadership for these companies, and it seems like we see the pendulum I've, swing I've, back and forth. I've heard of that recently in um, in a company that did. I mean, I hear this pretty regularly, but um, uh, one of the I think you know this one. One of the Dallas area companies, they fired their CIO who did outsourcing 
and then they actually rehired a lot of the people they outsourced and laid off. Oh, was it a pharmaceutical company? I uh, can't comment on it. I was going to say, I know a couple of use cases, unfortunately, where it wasn't no pharmaceuticals, but that's another example. I forgot about that, but yeah. that's another company that you and I are probably very familiar with in the Dallas oh, area, but yeah, we'll keep it on Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. So it, yeah. Cause I mean, we've seen the trends in, I mean, for certain, again, kind of like the guns and the cars in certain use cases, it can make sense, but there's that time delay and there is that fault kind of like the cloud. Everyone thinks it's cheaper and better and magical. For some things, it makes sense. If you want to throw up your CRM, mm -hmm. like, I mean, one of the most, bar none, most popular CRMs or customer relationship management platforms for, for folks who aren't uh, into the you know, business world. I mean, Salesforce is most popular, bar none. Yeah, it probably makes sense. To, they got their own servers. They got their own infrastructure. Yeah, it makes life easier. Maybe you don't need to have your on-prem CRM. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you're if you're a design company or a marketing company, you got all your on-prem design, you want your access to everything quickly, and... Also, you want to you know own your intellectual property in case you ever you know get rid of the business or you're acquired. I mean, it's there's much more very many more variables than people think. Yeah, I mean, similarly, like you know, I work in you know analytics is is bread and my butter, right? I mean, yeah. making data available for data scientists and analysts and all this stuff. So um, it's kind of fun, and I've implemented a lot of you know a lot of solutions and data warehouses, etc. On uh, Synapse, uh, Azure Synapse, uh, yeah. and Google BigQuery, and, you know, and it's kind of funny because everybody's super happy until they get the first bill, <laughs> True. because of the first usage bill, and suddenly it's like, oh, yeah. oh my god, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny because like one of our my semi recent uh, platform implementations went from Netiza on prem to Big uh, Google BigQuery, mm -hmm. um, and then. My IT partner came in and said, oh, we have to do something about optimizing this BigQuery usage because on one hand, I'm like, hold on a minute. I have a lot more people using the platform because they're, it's very easily accessible. You know, we can build stuff. There's all these extra functionality. You know, I'm like, uh, you got to be careful. I can't tell people not to use the platform mm -hmm. because it's like we're a lot more data driven. So there's a lot of value in that. Right, uh, Google yeah. BigQuery, you know, uh, etc. Um, but he goes, "Well, this is my monthly bill," and I go, "Holy crap! Oh dear God! <laughs> I can buy multiple Netizas. Like last time I bought Netiza, mm -hmm. I could literally buy multiple racks mm -hmm. of them every month for what I pay yeah. Google for the usage. Mm -hmm. like, I'm like, whew, I could buy like fifty yeah. Netizas for my yearly Google BigQuery bill. Mm -hmm. it's like." Yeah, it's cloud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody else's computer. You're going to pay to use that somebody else's computer. Exactly. You're paying for somebody else's computer. But boy, yeah. we got rid of the data center and the cola. We're saving so much money. It's like, well, you're kind of <laughs> just moving that money around. Mm -hmm. Are you At the end of the day, are you really? It's like, eh, I don't know. I mean, it breaks down the uh, barriers to entry. Very true. Like, hey, you no longer have to plunk down for the $1.2 million of EMC, right? And, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you can little, and you don't have to pay a bunch of sysadmins to go install that cluster and maintain yeah. it and all that. So, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, so you can literally start kicking data into it mm -hmm. uh, on Azure or, you know, Synapse or BigQuery, and you don't have to worry about running out of storage to, you know, upgrade it. I, I ran out of storage in a Netiza oh, platform really? before where I had to go buy another rack and, you know, well, in that case, I think by the time I ran out, they had the next generation out. So, like, I traded my old machine into IBM uh, and got the next level up, you know. Um, but I have to upgrade because I was, like, even with, you know, cleaning up stuff, I was about to run out, you know, oh, gosh. of storage because <laughs> it was an appliance. Appliances were great because oh. you could, IBM would roll it in, we would plug it in, and we could start pushing data into it. Yeah. They were great. They were like after client server appliances to me were especially in data warehousing mm -hmm. that was the greatest thing kind of like now it's the cloud because now yeah. there is no appliance to roll in you know you don't even have to have a you know sysadmin Just go need. make sure it you know it's pa got patched and has the right you know right ips you, just, you know you go to your cloud console yeah. that's all great I, all you need is a credit card right yeah but you're gonna pay for it well i mean yeah. there's no free lunches right exactly it's, so you don't have that entry you know entry you know you don't have to plunk down to 1.5 million up front to get that cluster in your on-prem, you have it in cloud. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, 
is 1.5 million plus how many sysadmins you don't need potentially. That's true right? too. But where do you need to have more people? Mm-hmm. Security, right? Yeah, that's true. Because, <laughs> you know, it was kind of funny. Um, at Crayon, we were obviously working, you know, we're, we're a cloud heavy company. Oh, yeah. Um, we would go to do all these assessments and, you know, one of the things that we would do obviously is optimize, um, the, uh, cloud expense for some of the clients and, you know, we would run some of these auditing tools. Yeah. Um, and they would, we would be like, okay, so you have these 50 VMs here. Who's using these? Because most of them hardly like they're sitting there they're, you're getting charged. Yeah. But they have no usage. Oh, I forgot I have those 50 VMs. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's I like, remember those. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, that's one thing. You know, it's going to cost you. But if those 50 VMs have some kind of sensitive data, and and again, maybe if their services, they're great because, you know, you don't have to deal with the patching, you know, of the yeah. security, whatever. But if they're re- true VMs where maybe they're Linux or whatever, like you have to go patch. Uh, somebody has to go patch them, making sure they're oh, they better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, make, making yeah. sure that they're secured. Right. Yep. Making sure that they're not, they don't have three ports that are open to, you know, out, yeah. you know, all this <laughs> stuff. So yeah, maybe you don't have as many, you don't have to have as many sysadmins doing the stuff, but a lot of comp- companies don't realize like you either have to have those people in house or you got to go work with somebody that you got to be able to secure those things. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there is like, a, there's no free lunches. Uh, it, remi- right. it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. You ever hear of Thomas Sewell? Hmm. He, he has one of my favorite quotes. He says, there's no such thing as solutions. There's only trade-offs. It seems like the older I get, the more I ponder it kind of rings true in more scenarios than not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, more, and you know, being the uh, technology architecture, everything you do, everything on the design side, or just like designing anything else, there's, yeah, there's, there's always trade-offs. Like you can yeah. build something that's like super stout, but then, yeah, then it's going to be maybe very expensive, right? It's very like, true. or, you know, inflexible or whatever, right? It's the, uh, I guess the Navy recently learned that lesson with the Zoom Walt. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we could build something that's really flexible. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the you know, again, we're going back to the keeping keep it simple stupid. Exactly. So um and there is very little simple about well, it's simple to push data into a cloud solution. True. But there is a lot on the back end that people forget about and then some you know, a lot of it is you still have to pay attention to. Oh, absolutely. Especially when or or you get the, you know, surprise bills or <laughs> you know. Um, and it is like one of those things with cloud, right? Like when we we're doing all these projects, people wanted to move stuff from on-prem to cloud, Yeah. but they were like, make it work exactly like it was on, on-prem. Like, <laughs> no, that's not how it works. So then you're going to, it's going to cost you a ton of money and you're going to have the idiosyncrasies of the limitation because those systems on-prem were built the way they were built because of the limitations of those things. Yeah. The same limitations don't apply to cloud. Exactly. So it's like, you know, you, you don't, you don't just basically just like take your data, plug it in there, or like application in there. Like there, there's so like take advantage of what that are, you know, the other platform you're going to in this case, cloud. Uh, so optimize it, you know, make that like complete lift and shift is probably not the greatest right? Yeah. because you really want to take advantage of it. Um, but I mean, this was at Crayon, you know, we were working a lot of companies and it was a lot, a very common trade-off. Like yep. they would be like, oh, you got to get off my data center in two months. Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't, <laughs> and I have like a uh, 50 million, de- you know, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, uh, SQL servers with, you know, uh, with X number of databases. It was like, okay, you're not giving me any time to be able to optimize. Like, I, like I, you're not giving me any option, but to create yeah. a bunch of VMs. And lift and shift completely yep. versus I would like versus an ideal scenario. It's like, well, I could go to the service, uh, you know, SQL server, whatever they call it nowadays, uh, you know, the service for option of it. So you don't have to have the VM. You just basically, you know, it's, you know, database that's taking care of itself as quote unquote, to, you know, exactly. versus so. Uh, yeah. Or, hey, I can isolate, you know, you have like 50 different data warehouse SQL Server machines, like I can literally consolidate all of those through a single Synapse instance. Yeah. Um, but they're not, you know, you're not giving me that, like, oh, I got to be off my data center in two months. Yeah. Like, 
you gave me like six months, nine months, yeah. you know, we can give you a cloud solution that, the, you know, and I don't have to do as many trade-offs mm-hmm. and, exactly. and I can optimize things and it's not going to cost you a ton of money. Right? You know, it will probably cost you a little bit more than on-prem stuff yeah. just in the pure cost, but then, you know, you have the staffing and, you know, whatever, all the different things. Uh, and then you got accessibility and extensibility and, you know, all the convenience, you know, all yeah. the convenience, like you don't have to take care of all the backups, yeah. you know, somebody else is dealing with the yeah. backups, you know, it's like, you don't have to drive across town to go to the data center in the colo during a winter, you know, winter, what was it? The Texas Arctic tundra a couple of years right. ago. It's like, oh yeah, we don't need to go to a data center and go fix that switch for them. Cause you know, it's someone else's problems, not theirs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, even colos can be interesting. Uh, I remember an IBM employee accidentally, uh, or I, was, I can't remember if it was an IBM employee or one of our colo, we had our colo location where e-commerce and our SAP instance were there and somebody did something to that cage oh, geez. accidentally. And suddenly uh, the week of Black Friday, you know, no. everything was down. Entire company was down. Oh my God. And, you know, we're on the phone yelling at our, you know, outsourcing slash colo you yeah. know, partner going like, you got to get this up. And I'm not going to say who it was, but um, it was very interesting because they were, and they were in the process of bringing it up, but they, the, the outsourcing Colo partner, one of the larger mm-hmm. technology companies in the world, um, decided that they didn't need the admins, the experienced admins in US anymore. So they outsourced it all to Eastern Europe to inexperienced guys and he decided he managed to enter their own command and overwrite the production system with the no. backup system that was out of date no so that system instead of coming up in a few hours was down for multiple days oh my, imagine gosh. the amount of money that we lost millions oh my gosh that's literally the most important time of the year for retail like mm-hmm. you don't do anything cute, well, especially you know, kind of cliche for everything. There's a reason why you have a freeze period. Yeah. We don't deploy any yep. changes to our systems, you know, between sometime in October, November till oh, yeah. well, October and till, you know, almost uh second week of January or whatever. So yeah. there's a reason for that, but we can't, you know, so we can't, you know, uh, I don't know. I think it was the cage lost power or something like that. I can't remember oh, what geez. it was, but yeah. it was literally like our SAP system, our e-com system, and you're like all these critical systems and our like uh, domain controller. It was like all of them were suddenly down. Like we were, we were like nothing. Oh my God. It, it was, and then just to top it off, yeah, you thought you were saving money by outsourcing your sysadmins. Well, not so much. Yeah. Oh my hmm. gosh. So, yeah, yeah, uh, well, like I said, trade-offs, right? Exactly. And you can't take a, you know, somebody you can talk to who has a lot of experience and yep. you can, can't basically just say, oh, I can replace that for somebody who makes one fifth the amount yep. that I can just hire off the street. Exactly. So, yeah, there's, it's like, you know, yeah, there's no free lunches. Exactly. 110%. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, thank you so much for coming on the show, Bro, I really Thanks appreciate it, Thanks for having buddy. me on. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to tune in. Don't forget to take the time to like, subscribe, and comment. And sh- don't forget to take the time to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your enemies, heck, tell your coworkers, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe. Y'all have a great day. Talks.